Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Ms. Thompson, I think you have the opening. I do. Um, I'm going to read something because um, I figured if I shut my eyes, I would miss a sentence. So um, this is where I'm going to say we're going to pray. Okay? <laughs> God, we need you. Some days feel so broken and uncertain. We're hurting, we're struggling. And we're aware more than ever of our own weaknesses and of the dark forces that constantly surround us, fighting to gain ground in our lives and our families. We choose to stand our ground today and say no more. We ask for your help to set aside our differences and to look at the greater cause, the cause of Christ. We ask that you would help us to truly live a life of love. We ask that you would surround this county and this country and cover us with your mighty hand. We pray for unity in our land, that in spite of our differences, we would be willing to stand strong together and live out our days with compassion and grace. Remind us to live aware, to redeem the time, and to listen to your words and be willing to make a difference in this county and in this country. Give us the courage to always speak up. Amen. Amen. May we all stand for our great flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any public speakers? Sorry, Mr. Chair. No, we do not. We do not have anyone signed up. All right. Thank right. you. Do we have any commissioners' response to the new speakers? I assume no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We have the consent agenda, and everyone I assume has reviewed that. Do we have any motions as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? There being none, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Let's just make sure the rest of the meeting goes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we have uh, Ms. Schaefer. We recognize you and appreciate your being here. Thank you. Can I take this off? Sure, absolutely. Okay? So you're not going to be able to hear me. <laughs> put it on. Um, so I'm Valerie Schaefer and I'm the um, district administrator of the Guardian Ed Lighten program here in Alamance County. And if you don't know what we do, um, I think we're the best kept secret in Alamance County um, that we use volunteers to advocate for abused, neglected children in court. We, we bring their voice to the judge. In fact, we're having a training tonight um, across the hall. Um, but once a year, um, the Guardian Lighten program along with the Exchange Club of Alamance County and the Alamance Burlington School System and the Alamance County Department of Social Services and Faith Connect and the Crossroads community, I think I got them all this time, um, we come together, we sponsor a um, child abuse prevention event. And <clears throat> prior to COVID, we had an in-person event at the historic courthouse that was beyond inspiring. 
and we had children's choirs to come in um, guardians came by the judges were there other elected officials um, read this proclamation I'm gonna uh, read to you in just a minute and it was is a little tiny 30 minute um, ceremony and then we planted uh, pinwheels to represent the children we had advocated for the year before plus the amount of children that had passed away in care throughout the state not not now Lance County but all the districts acknowledge and honor the children that died in care um, the year before and we would do that and then the county the maintenance department would illuminate the courthouse blue that's the color of child abuse pre uh, prevention um, every night the month of April from about 9 to 11 when it was dark enough that you could actually see the blue lights and um, and we just we have the perfect color of courthouse that works um, we started doing this about four years ago when um, we got the idea from San Francisco because they illuminate the Golden Gate Bridge um, and but nobody else was doing it at the time and I thought we've got the perfect courthouse that would show up and so we went to maintenance in the county they said sure and they had some blue lights but evidently our maintenance committee is mainly Duke fans and not Carolina fans and it was way too light um, by blue <laughs> the first year and so they came up with more blue lights for, uh, throughout the year and it's a really pretty royal blue uh, it's not a Duke blue it's a royal blue um, throughout the uh, month of uh, April and then I came down several nights to come look at it and it's there's enough wind in April to make the little pinwheels turn in their blue and silver so they sparkle in the blue light and it's just breathtaking you know, here in Alamance County but what I also saw was other people coming in the evening and just parking and looking because by 9 to 11 there's not much going on in Alamance County and, and Graham <laughs> but um, they would just park around the courthouse and just roll down the windows and look and it's it's so little but it's so moving that they're showing their support and so um, and in the days where there's not that kind of positive energy in around uh, the historic courthouse it's nice for one month out of the year everybody's kind of on the same page um, with this so even though we can't have all the children and everybody to come down and acknowledge that you know we want to get rid of child abuse in Alamance County we can at least do that in exchange this year for the in-person ceremony we're actually putting together a five-minute video um, and uh, community leaders have been contacted and and the um, our county IT guys actually he's in there um, it, he's putting together a five-minute video that will go out everywhere we hope and if that video has the distribution we think it's going to have we may never do an in-person um, event again the video is safer it gets the, it gets the word out and that's the point of it is to spread the word that child abuse needs to go away um, and so with that in mind we've asked that um, oh and we have two corporate sponsors that pay for the banners that will go up at the um, on the grounds as well as um, pinwheel signs the pinwheels and these other larger yard signs that will go out throughout the county and those um, corporate sponsors are impact Alamance and pit triad signs that um, fund that for us um, so here's the proclamation Whereas child maltreatment is a community problem and finding solutions depends on involvement among people throughout the community, whereas child maltreatment occurs when parents find themselves in stressful situations without community resources and unable to cope, whereas 110,245 children were reported as abused and neglected in North Carolina, and in Alamance County there were 2,479 reported from July 19 to June 20. And whereas, whereas 18 children were victims of child abuse homicide in North Carolina in 2018, and whereas child abuse costs the country over $124 billion each year, and whereas the majority of child maltreatment causes stem from situations and conditions that are preventable in an engaged and supportive community, whereas the effects of child maltreatment are felt by whole communities and need to be addressed by the entire community, whereas child maltreatment not only directly harms children but also increases the likelihood of criminal behavior, substance abuse, health problems such as health, heart disease and obesity, and risky behaviors such as smoking, whereas all citizens should be involved in supporting families raising their children in safe, nurturing environment, and whereas effective child maltreatment prevention programs succeed because of partnerships created among social service agencies, schools, faith communities, civic organizations, law enforcement, and the business community, 
Therefore, we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, call upon all citizens, community agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their participation in our efforts to prevent child maltreatment and strengthen the communities in which we live and do hereby proclaim the following. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month in Alamance County. The historic courthouse will be illuminated in blue light from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. starting on April 1st and continuing through April 30th, 2021. And that the pinwheels representing abused and neglected children, as well as two banners, be planted on the grounds of the historic courthouse for the month of April 2021. Thank you. Thank you. And we, and, and we as a board can't get away that quickly. <laughs> we as a board want to say thank you to you. present this to oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll note that all the commissioners have previously signed and we're all very, very supportive. And having practiced law for 47 years, I know what you guys <laughs> do. And we just really appreciate it. So, so absolutely necessary. Oh, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Thank, thank you. you very much. And look for the video. I will. <laughs> absolutely. And the pinwheel. Right. And you. definitely come down one night in April and park and bring something to munch on <laughs> and just spend some time in front of the prettiest courthouse in North Carolina because it's still nobody else does it. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Ms. Hey, good. I think you have the next. So, Commissioners, we do have uh, another proclamation. Uh, Concerning North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month, we do not have a representative from North Carolina 811 uh, with us this evening, but they are asking all 100 counties to uh, approve this proclamation or have it read in an effort to make sure the public knows uh, it's uh, the law. Call 911 before you dig and excavate. So if it's uh, appropriate, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to read the proclamation. Uh, proclamation North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month, April 2021. Whereas, as utility owners, excavators, designers, and homeowners work to keep pace with North Carolina's economic development, it's important to minimize damages to underground utility lines, danger to workers, and the general public, environmental impact, and loss of utility services to the citizens of North Carolina, and whereas North Carolina 811, a utility service notification center and leader in education, celebrates its 43rd year of continuous service to the state, is key to preventing injuries and damages when excavating, and Whereas this unique service provides easy one call notification about construction and excavation projects that may endanger workers and jeopardize utility lines while promoting workplace and public safety, reducing underground utility damage, minimizing utility service interruptions and protecting the environment. And whereas this vital service, which began in 1978, serves the citizens of North Carolina from the mountains to the coast, educates stakeholders about the need for excavation safety whether the project is as small as planting a tree to designing and beginning construction on a new interstate. And whereas in 2020, the North Carolina One Call System received 2.1 million notification requests and transmitted over 12.2 million requests, providing protection to utility companies' infrastructure, their employees, excavators, and customers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Alamance County proclaims the month of April 2021 as North Carolina 811 Safe Digging Month to encourage all excavators and homeowners of Alamance County to contact 811 either by dialing 811 or contacting NC811 via the webpage of nc811.org at least three working days prior to digging in order to know what's below, avoid injury, protect the environment, prevent millions of dollars in damages, and to remind excavators that three working days notice is the law for safe digging is no accident and that more information may be obtained by visiting www.nc811.org. Thank you. Yes, and again, just would note that all of the commissioners have already signed both of these resolutions and proclamations, and we just want to say thanks to everyone. 911 is important, but 811 may save your life as well. Amen. Thank you. Okay, our health director, who is known as Tony 
last name unknown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Um, so Very first good. and foremost, I want to thank the, uh, the the men, the women, the volunteers at the vaccination site. Especially last week, we had to do a last minute audible and quickly transition to first and second doses over at Eric Lane. So that took a lot of demobilization and, and logistics to make that happen. So thanks thanks to them for their unwavering dedication to, to make that happen. And a special thanks for the, to the city of Burlington for helping us have the study stadium site in the first place and also demobilizing the site. So a big shout out and thanks to the city there. Um, so our recent the update, so as of last night, um, two, 22 new cases came into the county of Alamance. Um, that gives us 309 active cases, six active cases in the hospital, and 240 deaths. That was uh, four more from when I last reported to you two weeks ago. That's the Our lowest hospitalizations we've had in quite a while. It, it, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, our weekly our weekly average is about 30 cases coming in a day and that's a drop from two weeks ago around 49 is what I reported to you so we continue to see those cases Way down too. <clears throat> all right so here's the the good news our, our percent positive is below five percent last reported on March 6 at 4.7 uh, percent and when I reported two weeks ago it was at 7.7 so we continue to see that go down our per 100,000 cases over 14 days has dropped from 400 to 277. Again, our goal here is to get that below 200, so we're getting close, and even below that, even below 100 would be nice. Um, so, but it is continuing to tread down. As far as our outbreaks and clusters, uh, nursing <coughs> homes, there are eight facilities with outbreaks. Residential care facility six, this is two less from when I reported to you last time. Zero congregant living and one correctional. Our clusters is a March 12th in child care, there are two. This is one less from when I reported two weeks ago and zero in K through 12. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And from our 2021 deaths, so January 1st moving forward, again, there was four additional deaths <coughs> from when I last reported to you. Two came from long-term care facilities, two from general population. Total deaths, 55 out of 6,083. Our long-term care facility, 27 deaths out of 231 cases. Our general population, so backing out the long-term care facilities, 28 out of um, uh, 5,852 cases. So it's about a 50-50 split between long-term care facilities and general population. Of those four deaths, three of them were 75 and older, and one was 65, um, between 65 and 74. All right, so our vaccination effort here, Alamance County residents, 31,945 have been partially vaccinated, so they've had their first shot. 19,347 have been fully vaccinated. The health department, out of our allocation of 15,000, 435 have given 16,592 first dose shots and 11,382 second dose shots. This is kind of the, the cool news when we look at our 65 and older population, over 75% have been vaccinated in Alamance County. So that is a huge and a great number to see. 18% um, of our total population has received their for at least their first dose, when we back out total population and we just look at vaccinated population, so 18 and older, 24% uh, of um, Alamance County residents um, that are designated as vaccine population have been vaccinated at least once with, with their first dose. All right, so we are currently serving um, groups one, two, and three. On March 17th, we'll transition to group four, 16 through 64, with one or more high-risk medical conditions for our severe um, risk for COVID-19. Um, I will say the online appointment scheduling and the call center has um, worked very, very well and integrated well, so kudos to our IT folks. Um, we've, been, we've been scheduling them as fast as we're putting them out there. It just takes about a day or two, and those appointments fill up pretty quick, so that's been ongoing. Um, as I mentioned, when I started with, we transitioned to first and second doses being mm -hmm. done at our Eric Lane site. Um, so tomorrow, tomorrow will definitely will be our first day where we're, both appointment calendars are full. We're going to be testing those processes, but I have confidence in our folks. We're going to deliver a wonderful customer experience 
Um, we continue to be allocated uh, 1170 baseline of Pfizer and 400 additional doses of Moderna. Um, so that has been our weekly um, uh, allocation. And then last week on March 10th, the Greensboro site serving uh, 30,000 per day opened up. So they're moving folks through, drawing, also drawing from the various counties, surrounding counties. But one of the things that's also happening is, if you think as Greensboro as the hub, um, we're also going to have a spoke site here in Alamance County. Um, thank you much to Cone Health who's driving this. Um, part of the spoke site, part of their mission is to really target um, historically marginalized populations. Um, that's gonna bring in an estimated 7,000 doses over the next three weeks. Um, Cone plans on giving those doses out um, at 300 doses a day over the course of four days each week at the City Gate Dream Center and then also at Eric Lane, so our, our vaccination site. Um, so that's good news. That's more vaccine coming into the county to vaccinate our Alamance um, County folks. Um, and it does not um, count against our baseline allocation. So that's additional doses on top of that. Um, additionally, as we reach out to historically marginalized population, we're in the process of putting out mailers to 27215, 27217, and 27253 zip codes. Um, if you look at those zip codes, um, those were a lot where a lot of our COVID-19 cases also came in. So we're going to put an advertisement out and really try to do a push for folks to come and get vaccinated uh, when it's their turn to do so. On April 10th, we'll be doing a town hall, our medical director, uh, Dr. Newt, will be doing a town hall in Spanish um, for Spanish outreach. We've reached out to African American churches um, and then also doing some so social media outreach um, to uh, North Park Community Center. So we're definitely doing a full court press on our, our HMP populations. We want them to come in and get vaccinated. Um, testing continues in um, within uh, Alamance County. Um, Optum is our testing vendor, so that continues through the uh, month of March and uh, going into April. Um, along the, the same note, um, the historic historian Emeritus, uh, previous Commissioner Sutton, um, sent a New York Times article. I don't know if everyone has seen it, um, but it was actually very intriguing that had to do with the PCR test, the um, polymerase chain reaction test. Um, so to kind of give you a, a little little history and context behind that. So first I say we don't we don't run a laboratory here locally um, in uh, here at Alamance County Public Health. We collect the specimens and we send them off to the state or our private vendor Optimum Cone actually either runs them through their laboratory or a contracted laboratory. Um, but for the most part, the, what this PCR article was talking about was possibly the oversensitivity of the test being a little bit too sensitive. Um, kind of put it in historical context, if you remember back in August or even a little bit before then, the whole push was on testing and they were just getting to a point where testing was ramped up um, and there was just about enough um, testing going on in the community. About the same time frame, the antigen test or what we call the rapid test was also starting to come to come about in the, 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 uh, the testing world. Um, so this is kind of looking back into to August, but the, the primary premise of the article um, had to do what they call cycle threshold. So the best way to look at cycle threshold is every time this test uh, cycles, it amplifies the genetic material uh, with um, on, on the swab that is used. So in my way, my simple mind works and to kind of adopt this. So back when I was a paramedic on a fire truck, we used a drug called epinephrine, and this is when somebody's heart stopped, you give them epinephrine. The saying was, if you gave someone enough, if you gave a rock enough epinephrine, you can get a heartbeat in a rock, right? <laughs> and so the, the kind of the same thing works here with the, the, the more you amplify it, the more likely you're gonna find this genetic, uh, this genetic material. Well, the problem is if, you, if it's too sensitive, it is likely that the, the virus is no longer active. You're just getting dead genetic material. Um, so you don't really know if the person is truly positive at the time. Looking back in August, when you're trying to get her ahead of the virus, right, that was a little bit relevant at the time. You just wanted to test somebody who was based on pass fail, see if they're positive and quickly ask them with the idea that hopefully this, this was going to decrease. Um, I think now it warrants actually a great conversation to have amongst the scientists and the folks that that um, look at this um, type of lab work is finding that nice threshold, um, what works to really show what material is active. Um, some argue it'd be anywhere from 30 to 35. I can tell you just by from the article, uh, the manufacturer sets the cycle threshold. 
um, and they're currently set at 37 to 40, but the scientists believe that's just too high. It should be a lot lower so they can kind of give the, the physician the ability to make the determination if someone truly has an active virus or not. So I just wanted to give you a little background on that as much as I could. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Does that mean they were false positives or? Possibly, so um, it was a study that out of, out of New York, so not here, that was done. And possibly if they were using that four, this is according to the article, um, that 40, 40 cycle threshold, 90% of those tests were too, too high um, and possibly showing false positives on there where folks weren't actively contagious. Do you know the percentage of educators that you vaccinated? I, I see Dr. Benson and Dr. Gatewood <laughs> here, I thought. <laughs> I, I do not know the percentage, but I, I can say that um, working with um, the, the ABSS, working with the private schools, and of course the child care facilities, everyone that um, was on the list to uh, that indicated they want a, a vaccine was at least contacted and offered the vaccine to, to schedule an appointment. Okay. Good. You called some of those that were vaccinated customers. Can we also call them very, very thankful and appreciative? <laughs> I certainly was when, when you guys gave me the vaccination. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, quick question. Uh, for the additional vaccines that Cone is bringing in on this spoke model, uh, do people, the citizens access that through Cone's website or through the health department's website? So we actually have both websites um, it, it will be through cone so you could actually you could access it through cone or um, you can go to vaccinatealamance.com and we have the link to cone's website that'll take them take them right there to get scheduled so you have the option of choosing the Alamance county health department um, scheduling or cone scheduling just by doing www.vaccinatealamance.com okay and would it matter whether you went to the, the i mean if they're all going to be at the same location does it matter if you go to the cone site or the health department site within the health department's website? Um, so no, it really, really doesn't matter, but for the FEMA allocation specific to that spoke site, it would, would, would make a difference because they are going to do um, at the Dream Center um, vaccinations there. But I, I would encourage folks to go to each site and see where you can schedule an appointment. Appointments are available. I think you also would probably emphasize uh, a number of people, and this is basically for our audience, um, are signing up at multiple sites so if you do that and plan to cancel one please cancel it because you're causing major concerns to other facilities and and also to the health department if you don't cancel the one you're not using yeah that, that is correct and we do have the the number up on the website that you can call to cancel that appointment and as soon as that's canceled we'll gladly fill it with somebody else um, and, and that's a lot I think the Times News had a recent article talking about the number of minority groups that are numbers in minority groups that are not getting don't know that the vaccines are available evidently and I'm I know you've used newspaper television I've seen it on Fox 8 WFMY News 2 and Channel 12 I uh, presume you've been using radio. I don't listen to the radio that often, but I presume you've been using that. I've seen it online. What other methodologies can we use to communicate this with the, in particular, the seeing the numbers were the worst and the Hispanic community? What can we do to try and push this down into the Hispanic community so that they're aware that we have these vaccines available? Yeah, so, um, yeah, you're right. We have, we have some work to do there. And all right, so we have actually an advertisement going out in Cape Pasa newspaper um, here pretty soon. Um, as well as the town hall that we're doing on <coughs> April 10th, of course, through our social media outlets. One thing is that we did at the health department is we went back through our caseload over the past year um, and we sorted out the data of those that have identified as African American or Hispanic and we started making calls. Are you interested in getting your shot? Let's see if we can get you into an appointment. So we've actually did that for those that we had were able to contact direct outreach to see if they're interested in getting their vaccine. Have we looked at the possibility of maybe a couple of billboards along the interstate? I mean, almost that, that, those populations typically travel from one end of the county to the other, and they'll hit the interstate at some point. If we put some billboards, and we might even be able to get some, um, some access to some digital billboards through some of the people that own those that might do some public service type advertisements for us on that. 
So the answer is yes, we'll, we'll reach out and, and uh, great idea. Yeah. I'm just curious, with nearly 23,000 students, that's a lot of parents. Have we ever thought about um, this pulling the school in for like the robocall, the email? Because you have direct conduct, you know, contact. Oh, yeah. That's just right there. I, I didn't know that's allowed, HIPAA, there's all kind of things like that. I keep looking at you, you're not looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> and so I, I was just thinking out loud. So, just curious. Having two grandkids that are now in the uh, L.S. Burlington school system, I know they get robocalls every single week, maybe multiple times. Uh, is that a possibility? And I'm getting shaking the head from Dr. Benson, so <laughs> thank you. So I'll be calling Dr. Benson. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you'll advertise in uh, the Alamance News, the Times News, and the Melbourne Enterprise. Thank you. Can you believe you vaccinated that many people from the beginning? I mean, you like walked into Alamance County and bam. And I mean, we still can't pronounce your last name, but I look at everything that you have led. I, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so proud we've got you. And I, that's just when you see the numbers, because it just goes and goes and goes for y'all. You don't even think, so to speak, about the numbers. That's so, that's a tremendous amount of work, and having to be really versatile and flexible, and move a tent down a tent, move a tent. I mean, none of us really know what's really happened. We just get the, the numbers. It's amazing. Thanks. We have great people and great volunteers to make all that happen. IT is rocking. I'm just going to say. <laughs> I might indicate to this board that we're so, so, and I've indicated this to the health director, uh, we're so glad that we stole you for for Scythe County and you cannot go back. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. I won't ever get over epinephrine and a rock. <laughs> 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 okay. Mr. Haygood, I think you're going to recognize the next speakers and present, are you not? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, uh, just a few things to cover with the commissioners uh, for this next item on the agenda. Uh, plan is to talk a little bit about our capital plan for next fiscal year as well as the capital finance plan. So you should have two uh, documents hard copy before you and also we're in your packet. This is the capital plan and it is in draft form and uh, the capital finance plan is also before you bound a little bit smaller document. There's no need for action on these items tonight. This is simply uh, to give the commissioners kind of an overview of what's going on with both of these documents and give you an opportunity to ask questions. We've talked a little bit about the capital financing plan. We have uh, uh, Dr. Benson here from the school system and Dr. Gatewood also and their staffs are here with us too, Dr. Cook and Matt Bankman. I don't know if Tom is here or not. I'm virtual. Uh, virtual, yes. So we've got several folks here if you have questions about uh, uh, school system or college projects. But uh, at this point, we'll get started, talk a little bit about this document, the capital plan. Uh, basically, if you go through this document and look, it's got details for all the capital projects for the county, school system, and the community college. And these capital projects include ones that are the pay-as-you-go projects, um, as well as ones that are funded by debt or capital reserve. And in fact, there's uh, each group, the county, the school system, and the college have a five-year pay-go plan in this document. So you can look at it and see what each group is planning for the next five years to do with their pay-go, not bond debt or uh, uh, capital reserve necessarily. Now there's also, uh, details in this document about each one of the education bond debt projects, pictures, when they start, when they finish, some details about each project. And there's also the same data uh, about the installment loan projects that the county is uh, considering or in, is in this book too. Um, and there's also uh, uh, some information about projects from the county's perspective that we're using capital reserve or outside dollars. These are all projects that we talked about several weeks ago um, when I told you about the county's facility plan. So this, this document is in draft. It's for your consideration. You can look at it and it, it should give you a good idea of all the projects, but uh, uh, with the funding details and everything. But it's in draft form right now. We plan to present it to you in June uh, for you to consider and adopt. Understanding when you adopt, it doesn't mean we're automatically gonna do these projects, but you have adopted this plan. Each one of these projects, either bond debt or county installment loan, has to come back before the board. So adopting this plan doesn't mean you're automatically doing all the projects in the county's retina. It's just you've adopted the plan. We would come back to you about each one. So. 
Um, just a light touch on the capital plan. I think most of the time tonight uh, we'd like to spend discussing is the other document, the capital financing plan. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Ted uh, Cole with us this evening from Davenport. They've been working with us since before the vote by the public on the uh, bond referendum to try to use this financing, financing plan that you have before you as a tool to project costs and revenues for the county's capital plan. So it includes costs and revenues for um, oops, the county, the school system, and the community college project. And the capital financing plan uh, is put together using project cost estimates, timelines, estimated interest rates, uh, trending revenues, particularly um, sales tax lottery for the school system. Also how we uh, would project to use capital reserve for all three groups. And uh, it now includes operation costs of the new ABSS and ACC project. So we're looking at a request from the board on April 5th, an approval of the final approval to issue bond debt for all $150 million worth of ABSS projects and for $17,560,000 for uh, the community college. That is only for the Biotech Center of Excellence. They were approved by the voters to issue um, $39.6 million. In April of this year, we're proposing to um, issue $17.5 million worth of debt uh, for, the, for the college. So on April 5th, the commissioners will be asked to approve the final debt issuance resolution that will allow these bonds to be sold. Um, when you look at the capital plan, uh, you're going to see that uh, uh, we're remaining compliant with all county debt ratios as we got ready to issue this debt. We worked with Davenport. We established several important debt ratios that we wanted the board to approve different benchmarks. We currently need all those. We've also had a call last week with the local government commission and their branch of the North Carolina Department of Treasury uh, uh, to talk with them about the debt we're preparing to issue. We went over our capital plan with them, uh, our notice of sale, went over all this documentation with them, and they were very comfortable with our capital financing plan. They felt like that was uh, good planning, good financial planning, and understood it, and, and were pleased with it. So this slide shows you a list of the school system projects that the debt would be issued in April for, uh, the new high school, uh, and, and this also shows you the date that uh, the school system believes and is preparing for the bids to come back in. Right? Some of the bids are already in, and, and this is very important to the LGC. It's important that we have these bids in our hand when we go to issue the debt. They like to see that you've got a pretty solid proposed cost for each one of these projects. So uh, the school system is looking at on March 18th getting their final bid for the new high school, uh, Southern High School, uh, end of March. South Mevin, I believe that's already uh, wrapped up last, uh, last July. Cummins is already uh, wrapped up from a bid perspective. Uh, Graham High School and Williams High School also, I believe, have already. It's one week behind. Williams will be this week. Okay. And uh, Eastern and Western are coming in very shortly. We have one project from the school system, Pleasant Grove, that we're looking at not having a bid in hand for until June 14th. We talked to the LGC about this. Would they feel comfortable issuing uh, $150 million worth of project fund debt for these projects if we didn't have the bids in hand for Pleasant Grove. They, they felt like uh, that would be okay with them, and I'll tell you why. There was a couple of reasonings why the LGC felt like uh, that, would be, that would be acceptable. And then for the community college, we have the same, the same situation. We're only proposing to issue debt for the Biotech Center of Excellence, but uh, the college doesn't believe they're going to have their uh, final bid for that project until May, May 17th. And again, the LGC indicated to us that they felt like we're issuing enough debt. There are several reasons why they felt like it would be okay for the county to go ahead and issue the bond debt based on the proposed prices that the college and the school system believe the Pleasant Grove project and the community college project would come in at. And the reasons are that they feel like um, these projects will likely qualify for bond premiums. So if uh, the Pleasant Grove project or the ACC project came in over the amount. It's possible you could use premium to pay for that. We're going to talk about premiums. But that's an option. Both groups also have capital reserves available. So if one of those two projects came in a little higher than the uh, plan was, you could tap uh, one of the uh, either group's capital reserves. The college has future debt issuances. So if the Biotech Center of Excellence came in a little bit higher than the 17560, you could cover that in a future debt issuance. Or uh, 
you know, the, the school system is issuing all $150 million worth of debt at one time. And basically, if for some reason the premium wouldn't cover that or the commissioners didn't want to issue premium, you'd have to value engineer some of the projects to make it fit. All that to say the local government commission feels comfortable with the county issuing debt without having the firm bid uh, prices in hand for Pleasant Grove and for the Center of Excellence. So, um, I do think it's important for us to do some, have some discussions with the commissioners about these bond premiums. I've just mentioned that. You've heard a lot about bond premiums. Uh, we, need to, we need to talk about bond <coughs> premiums. That's why uh, Ted's with us tonight. He's going to walk us through a high-level look at our capital financing plan and kind of go over some of the scenarios that are in that plan. Because the staff, as staff, we need direction from the commissioners. When we go to, um, actually we'll sell the debt on uh, April 20th, but on April 5th when the board votes, we'll need to hear from you what do you think about bond premiums you've seen several of these scenarios in the plan is there a consensus among the board what's the best route to go take the premium not take the premium take some of the premium uh, or, or not take any of it because when we go to issue the debt on the 20th we'll need to know some level of consensus from the board so um, I'm happy to answer any questions but I really think this is a good opportunity to uh, ask Ted to come up and speak to the board a little bit about the uh, the different scenarios in the financing plan. And I think Bruce has it prepared to pull up on the big screen too. Okay. And Brian, before he gets there, the, the construction manager is only for the high school. And Southern High School. Okay, but not all the deals. Correct. Yeah. See, we did CMR on the high school and Southern High School. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Ted Cole with Davenport. Pleasure to be here. Before we get into the slides themselves, I do want to um, just cover a couple of things verbally that I think will be helpful. Um, and some of this will be a little bit of a re repeat of what Brian said. But um, again, tonight is for discussion purposes. There is the final board action on the GO bonds on April 5th. It's called an issuance resolution. And that's also the night that staff would like to get some direction from you all on premium. And I'm going to explain that here in a moment. Um, we have rating agency calls this week. These bonds will be rated. We expect that that will be a very positive process. Um, all of those things come together around April 9th. That's when the offering documents for these bonds, the documents that investors look at, will be posted out on the municipal bond market. There's an electronic bidding platform that all local governments use. Um, and. Alamance County's bond documents will be posted there on April 9th. That gives us about a week and a half where investors are looking at bonds, doing their credit work, other due diligence, and at 11 o'clock on April 20th is when the bids will be received for y'all's bonds, for the, for the 150 of ABSS bonds and the 17.56 um, million of community college bonds. That is the date, April 20th, where the interest rates will be set. They'll be um, fixed at that point. We'll know exactly what the annual debt service payments will be um, by noon that day. Um, the bonds will close on May 6th. That's when the money changes hands. So we, we set the interest rates on April 20th, and we close and fund the bond on, on May 6th. Um, this concept of bond premium is not unique um, to Alamance County. It is a function of the municipal bond market, and I differentiate that from going to a bank. When a local government borrows from a bank, they typically get a single interest rate for a 10 or 15 year term, and there is no premium generated. It's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward loan process. In the municipal bond market, because these bonds are ultimately getting sold to lots of different types of investors, um, individuals and, and institutional investors like, um, like bond funds, like insurance companies, money managers, things like that. Um, we find that bond premiums are um, just part and parcel of the bond market. We cannot really control whether or not we get the premium. They're, there are very standardized bidding parameters that municipal bonds um, use, and particularly in North Carolina, and the Local Government Commission is a party to all of that. Um, and, and this is how I would explain it. If we are generally, for a 20-year bond of a AA-rated county, we're in the 2% range 
for interest rates. But we may find that our bonds are sold with a 5% coupon or a 4% coupon or a 3% coupon. So you have these coupons on the bonds that are higher than that general 2% market that I spoke of. We are in a low interest rate environment. And when that happens, a premium is created. And again, we would not want to limit the bidder's ability to bid that premium bond. That would not be conducive to a positive sale, and I think it would end up costing the county quite a bit of money. So rather than trying to control whether we get the premium, where we, where we maintain control is how much of that premium do we want to take? Um, and that's really the question that I think will come full circle to you all, understanding that we're likely to get a premium, and I'm gonna use some current market estimates um, on ABSS for a $150 million issuance amount, um, we might be in the range of 20 to $25 million of premium. That is not guaranteed, right? It's gonna ebb and flow with the market and the, and the bidders, but in today's environment, that is a reasonable estimate. For the ACC $17.5 million borrowing, um, we could be around 2.5 to 2.8 million of premium. Okay, and so the question will become for you all, how much money do you want to walk away with when these bonds close? And we will build into our bidding parameters the ability to downsize the bond issue to land at a known amount of money. And that's how all general obligation bonds are sold, um, and particularly in North Carolina. So. That, again, I want to emphasize this is not unique to you all. This is, this is standard in the municipal bond market. So the likelihood of a premium, I think, is very high, exactly how much to be determined. But the real question will be when we close on the 150, or when, when we price these bonds, rather, this is an April 20th decision, right? This is a decision that's made on the morning of April 20th when the bonds are sold, and staff will want the direction from you all going into that how much money do we want to uh, walk away with? Do we want to take all the premium that the market offers us or do we want to downsize the bond issue and land at some lower dollar amount that you all would, would dictate? Um, so that's how this premium is generated. And, and um, the, we, we will build into the bidding documents for these bonds flexibility so that um, what you all decide on April 5th, we'll have the ability to make those adjustments without impeding at all the county's ability to get positive and, and, and competitive bids. Um, so let me pause there. There may be a question on that concept uh, or discussion on premium. I'm happy to try to answer questions. It can be a little bit of a convoluted topic, but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Is the interest rate affected at all by whether we take premium? The, um, there's about three different ways we calculate interest rates. They're all accurate, but they're done a little bit differently. So um, one way that we often talk about is called a true interest cost or a TIC. And no, that's going to be true whether you take the premium or not. Um, what will become an issue is um, the average coupon on the bonds, which is what interest is calculated off of. Make no mistake, if you take this premium, it, it's not free money, you're paying it back, so your, your annual payments will be higher, even though we're in a very attractive interest rate. If you sell the 150 million of ABSS bonds, but you get $175 million of proceeds, um, you're getting a, a, a a 2% interest rate, but you're getting um, you're getting 24 million of extra of dollars that's got to be baked into the total debt service payments on an annual basis. Okay. Um, in our planning models all along, we had been using a 5% interest rate, right? So we knew that back when we started this, we were a few years out from the first bond issue and we're still a few years out from subsequent bond issues that ACC might do as they go through their projects. Um, that 5% interest rate uh, is what ran through the models and ultimately in fiscal year 20, um, in addition to other things, there was a, a tax rate 
of 7.04 cents um, attributed to this total package, 5.64 cents for ABSS and 1.4 pennies for ACC. Um, as we've evolved, and as I've alluded, we're in a lower interest rate environment today. And so as a result, um, we have an opportunity within our model to provide some flexibility to you all. And, and all of this, in my, in my eyes, are, is good news. We're well below that 5% interest rate. And if, I guess this is what we want to ensure you all, and, and some of you have seen some of these worksheets, if there is a desire to take all of the premium that the market might give you, if that's a desire, um, you all can handle that annual debt service payment within the model. The model has enough cushion in there when we use that 5% interest rate to accommodate selling these bonds and taking the premium. If you decide to downsize the bond issue, you don't want to take all of those funds on April 20th, that will only create more cushion in the model. Um, and you will be left with, if you do decide to downsize the bond issue, if you don't want to take all of the premium or you only want to take some of the premium or perhaps none of the premium, um, you will be able to carry forward some voter authorized general obligation bonds that you could issue at a later date for some school or, or community college project. Um, the other thing that the models um, are able to accommodate is to not only cover the debt service associated with all these projects, but the operating costs associated with the new high school and the operating costs associated with um, certain community college projects. So um, there's, some, there's some nice flexibility built into all of this. Um, and so I guess with that, I wanted to flip through a few slides here just to help you all visualize um, how these cash flows work and I'll try to answer questions as we go. Yes, sir. Good question. If we were to adjust through the premium to the net to the 150 that we have to have for the school system, that would reduce the bond of 125, am I correct? Correct. Now, what would the adjusted tax rate be at that level? Do don't know, know that, that I have that available I'm, tonight, I'm but we can get that for reducing you. Reducing some property tax versus I think you'd we'd have to, some property tax. We'd have to rerun that scenario and see what happens if you reduced a penny or two pennies. How would the capital reserve flow? You know, would it get right. down to any capital reserve left? I think at that point you'd want to the commissioners would probably want to think about what kind of money do you want in capital reserve? You know, do you want right. to maintain some level of, and again, these are projections, so it's kind of iffy, but uh, and I would think the commissioners at some point are probably gonna to wanna to think about, is there a dollar amount we'd like to see in capital reserve right. that doesn't get touched? Because you've got two funding sources, I'm, I know Ted's gonna go through this, but sales tax revenue, lottery funds, a little more volatile than your property tax. They total, I think, about in close to $9 million a year. Uh, of this funding plan so you know you may want to make sure there's some capital reserve in case we hit the recession because this is a 20-year debt it's probably wise to have some cushion in the plan in case you get into a recession and those uh, sales tax or lottery numbers start falling off you can tap capital reserve to make the payments because uh, the debt will get paid no matter what once it's issued so um, we could run scenarios where there are you know lesser property tax revenue coming into the plan we don't have them tonight though Right. Can you get those numbers to us before the April 5th meeting? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yes, sir. So let me let me cover a few slides here just with having set that up. Um, and there are page numbers in the lower right corner here. You may well need to uh, refer to your hard copy. Um, this page one shows you the overall capital plan. Um, it goes out to fiscal year 2025, and there are basically three sections here. The top third is looking at the county-related CIP, or Capital Improvement Plan. Not only the debt, the projects to be debt-funded, but also the annual pay-as-you-go that flows through the county project, uh, the county CIP, about 250000 a year. All in on line 17 over this period of time, that's about $35 million worth of projects that are designated for, for the county. 
the middle of the page is ABSS, so over this same um, period of time, that's about 175, almost 176 million of projects. Again, 150 that's debt funded, as well as an, an allocation for annual pay as you go of approximately 3.3 million. And then the bottom third is ACC, the community college, about $39.6 million of debt funded projects that was approved by the voters. And then three to four hundred, two to three hundred thousand dollars a year of pay as you go. So this entire CIP from fiscal year 19, which is a couple of years past, we've done some of these projects already, through fiscal year 25, all in, this is about a, a little over $250 million capital program. Okay? And that's been um, pretty constant throughout this planning process. That is the universe of projects that we're dealing with. Um, our debt assumptions on page two, very straightforward, met with good reception by the Local Government Commission, generally 15 and 20 year debt. It's amortized in a, a pretty rapid fashion and, and again, we're using planning rates um, of four and a half and five percent for the long term debt. So if all of this were to happen on page three in the upper left corner, that becomes the new debt profile of the county, inclusive of county, ABSS, and ACC. So you can see in that upper left graph, the, the darker green bars represent the debt profile that's on the books today for the debt you have issued. And then we're incrementally adding to that the bond issues as years go by, and again, this this CIP assumes about $216 million worth of debt to be issued. That is the GOs that were authorized by the voters, plus some installment debt um, primarily for county related projects. So all of these have been incorporated in that planning model. Okay. Uh, Brian had mentioned on page four, debt ratios, debt policies. Um, this plan allows us to demonstrate continued compliance with those policies, so we have no concerns there. Um, again, talk through elements of this with the Local Government Commission. We will, we will talk through elements of this with the rating agencies. We have no, um, no concerns about our ability to demonstrate that this is a level of debt, although it is, is, is a large amount, is, is very much within the range of what the county can take on responsibly, particularly as it relates to some key debt ratios. We're, I don't think there's any, any question there. And so with that, we set up these funding plans. And I, I won't go through every page here, but what I'd like to show you here on page five is a snapshot of the county plan. Um, we have incorporated into this page not only the existing debt that's been issued already to support county projects, but the new debt that we will issue if the CIP gets funded the way it's been laid out, as well as the pay-as-you-go funding, the non-debt funded capital projects. And essentially, there's really one primary source of funding. It's an appropriation from current year revenues of about $2.5 million. And, is, and, and what we've demonstrated here is that if you can continue to budget that level of current year revenues every year, um, this county capital plan can be funded without additional revenues required. The county also has about seven and a half million of capital reserves. Brian had mentioned capital reserves. So that is some accumulated dollars that have been accumulated over time that are a resource to the county for their their projects. So there's really an ongoing annual appropriation of current year revenues of about two and a half million, as well as capital reserves of about seven and a half million. And all of those are adequate to fund this capital plan. And there was no, back in 2020, there was no part of the tax adjustment uh, that was made that was attributable to the county CIP. So, okay. like I asked you, when you tried to teach me on this. Right. This 2.5, this was my loan. My coupon book would have a 2.5 for every year, once a year, the sitting once a month. It, this is all on an annual basis. Yes. Okay. All on an annual basis. Okay? So the county plan is, is pretty straightforward and, and I think um, not, a, not a lot of explanation. They are, nothing in this upcoming bond issue is for county purposes. 
So we transition over to the school system. We've got several slides, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but let me get you oriented here on page seven. It's the same basic setup, meaning we have all of the debt that has currently been issued for schools under column B, and we have the new debt that would be issued attributable to that 150 million of GEO bonds that were approved by the voters, as well as their pay-go for capital projects, pay-as-you-go in column D. So we have existing debt, proposed debt, and pay-as-you-go. The proposed debt on this page seven is consistent with the planning work that we did. So essentially that four and a half or five percent interest rate um, is, is what we're showing you here. We have not included the operating costs associated with the new high school. We will layer that in in a moment. In the middle of this page, you'll notice, and Brian alluded to it earlier, there are a few more moving parts to how the debt is budgeted for ABSS. Um, there's Article 40 and 42 sales tax. That's a restricted sales tax that has to be used for school capital or debt. There's lottery funds, um, and there is new revenue generated from the tax adjustment that was made in fiscal year 20. So remember, uh, that's column K. Their share of that was approximately 5.6 pennies worth of revenue, and we've built that in. They have some capital reserves, not quite as much as what the county had accumulated, but about a million and a half worth of capital reserves. So the concept is the same, which is we've got annual dollars, although with ABSS, it's coming from three or four different pots every year, primarily sales tax and lottery, and the new tax revenue derived from the rate increase. And under our planning work, all of that cash flows just fine. In fact, there's some cushion in here. Okay, so where we've evolved to the next page is layering in the projected operating costs associated with the new high school, and that's under column E. Okay, um, we're still using the planning interest rates here. This generally works, it's a little tight. Uh, when we add in that operating cost, you'll see that under column E, it starts in fiscal year 24. Um, that is, I guess, a best estimate at this point. Time will tell on that as that evolves. Um, and that's something I think that Brian alluded to earlier is, is sort of waiting to see how that actually plays out from a budgetary perspective. But at the planning rate with the operating costs, this, this model still works. So as we have gotten closer to the bond issue, we have started to look at um, making an assumption about current interest rates. So coming from that 5%, 45 to 5% planning rate down closer to current market, and what you're going to see is the debt service in column C is lower than it had been, right? That's the cushion that we now are, are recognizing in this plan, and all things being equal, there's more cash accumulated in this plan for um, for contingency, for other projects, for a consideration of adjusting the tax rate, whatever this board ultimately decides to do. Even if you take that premium that the market gives you, which could be, as I've said, in that 20 to 25 million, that works in the plan if you choose to take that money on April 20th. And then we progress to, to saying, well, what if we don't want to take that premium? We downsize the bond issue on page 10. It works even better. There is even more cushion flowing through this because all of those revenues are the same. The sales tax, the lottery tax, the tax rate revenue. Um, obviously, they're projections, but we haven't changed those assumptions in any of these cases. So all things being equal, as we have lowered the bond amount, to cut out some of the premium and land closer to that $150 million mark, um, this cash flows e uh, even a little better. And that's really the takeaway on all of these. It's, it's under any of these scenarios, given where rates are, and because ABSS is issuing all of their debt at one time, it's not spread out, um, we've got a little better ability to, um, to to measure the impact of the current market because there aren't these future bond issues that we're still unsure of. So, so again, we know we're going to be better than our planning rate. We're pretty comfortable that you're going to receive a premium bid. 
the question will be do you want that premium if you do you'll be able to take it the local government commission is comfortable with that it happens all the time if you don't want to take the premium or you don't want to take all of the premium that is an option certainly and we would adjust the bond issue down to land at whatever dollar amount you all would like to make available for the ABSS projects and if we do that there'll be some geo bonds that could be issued sometime over the next five or six years if you choose to do that you don't have to issue all of that 150 at once if, if you decide to downsize the bond issue okay the the the, the the ACC plan is, is really much the same except on a smaller scale. It's a smaller bond issue. It's 15.7 million. Um, and so the premium is still a, a concept, although it's closer to $2 million of premium because it's a smaller bond issue. Our, our plan was based off of five, four and a half and five percent interest rates. We're well below that. But the unknown with ACC is that there are future bond issues planned excuse me, against the 39 million that the voters approved. So there will be another bond issue currently scheduled for late summer, early fall, and then a couple in, in the outer years. So we, we don't have quite the ability to quantify the, the impact of the debt service on the ACC plan like we did with ABSS because ACC is spread out over multiple bond issues over at least a couple, two, three year period. But the takeaway here for this first bond issue is um, we're lower than our planning rate. If you decide that you want to take the premium, albeit a smaller amount, that fits in the plan. If you decide you want to downsize the bond issue, you can certainly do that. Um, and we can cover the operating costs associated with the ACC projects. Um, there there um, two primary sources of funding are an appropriation from the county and the revenue derived from 1.4 penny tax adjustment in FY20. So their, their, their plan is pretty simple as well. It's, it's what they've historically been given, which is just under $3 million a year, plus the revenue from that 1.4 pennies. So it's a, a more predictable stream of revenue to service their plan than what you might see in ABSS again because that's tied to sales tax and lottery which can be a little more volatile so while on the one hand we know there's future bond issues we don't know it at what interest rate they will be issued we also have revenue streams here that are a little bit more predictable um, and 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 I think um, Ideally, um, as you think about this concept of the premium and how much money do you want to net from this bond issue, you do it for ABSS and for ACC separately. That would be the ideal direction I think that you could give staff is, look, we would like to target X dollars for ABSS and Y dollars for ACC. Um, when April 20th comes around. Any questions? I have one small one, just a math question. Um, you said the f first issue is 17.5 million is what we're going to issue. Uh, you, you said another number that I just I, I just can't find. You said fifth, the second issue, we're going to have a second issue in September? And right. that will be the balance. If we take uh, 17.5 and subtract it by, from 39.6, that's what we're going to issue in September? Nope. I'm going to get you there. Um, okay. Go to page 3. Thank you. And go under the community college <laughs> column. There's 17.56, mm -hmm. and then there's a $6.2 million borrowing, and then a 15.8. All of that would be the sum of their 39.6 million that were authorized okay. so but that is more than three projects if I'm not mistaken that's yes the next one in September is the student services center at uh, 6.2 million and then they still would have public safety training center uh, the child care expansion uh, and instructional space and then the two um, satellite locations mm -hmm. yeah and those are all uh, well the uh, Public Safety uh, Training Center, September of 2022. 
Yes, they're all September of 2022. Yeah, so that's yeah. when you will uh, issue more bonds for... For ACC. Yes. Right, right, for 22 and 23. Uh, I guess what my question is, is what are we going to get in September? What are you going for in the bond market in September? We are going, it, under the current plan, we would be looking to just fund the 6.2 million. Okay. That's an estimated number, just the 6.2 million associated with their um, well, I guess my question is if we're, and then we're going to come back to the bond market in 23 and ask and, and sell 15.8 more bonds. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just, just for my fellow commissioners and the public, uh, what was, what, what was your opinion of going to the bond market in September and getting the balance of 15.8? Since the interest rates are low, why are we going to take a chance of, interest rates are going up, I'm telling you, I'm in the finance business interest rates are going up right and I'm just curious that in 12 and 15 months I'm expecting inflation to be at 3 percent 50 percent higher than where it is now and I guess my question to you as a professional wouldn't it be wiser to go get all this money now when the rates are low rather than waiting and and we're going to take it in 23 23 the market is going to be completely different than what we're looking at now right completely different I, I think um, I think there is merit to that approach and in in many other states you could do that in, in North Carolina with the local government commission getting ahead mm -hmm. of those projects being designed and bid um, there, there's a point at which they say we're just not going to let you borrow for yeah. Um, those future projects until you have a better sense of the of the bid. So is that what the bond market has has, has done to Alamance County? Is they've looked at our our um, balance sheet and they've said, okay, we will loan you. We'll let you come to the bond market and issue a hundred and sixty-seven million because that's what your balance sheet will take, and we're going to uh, let you submit those numbers again in twenty-two and twenty-three for the balance of the money that we're looking for. Right, and, and we'll go through another off, uh, approval at the county board level for each of those. Why are we waiting that long to go ahead and, and go forward with those other projects? I would defer to. Well, I think the, the community yeah. college, you know, we talked about uh, we, need, we need the bids in hand, right, to get the LGC to allow us to borrow the debt. They are going to. Uh, they are willing to allow us to do it for Pleasant Grove, and for uh, the Biotech Center of Excellence because these future debt issuances are in place. But I don't believe we could go and not have any of the bids, not have any of the designs. I don't. I don't think the college has completed sure. designs and won't have bids for a while for the um, remaining projects. Is that is that right? That's right. Why can we not do that? I mean, it, oh. Well, I think there's another way that's going to cut here. I mean, maybe we could look at our premium. Go grab that premium now and not issue it back later. Can we do that? The the um, the premium needs to follow the the bond authorization. So if there's a premium that's generated off of the 150 million for ABSS, that premium needs to be spent on ABSS projects. Well, wouldn't that be what we're doing? Wouldn't that be what we were doing? We're actually borrowing the money, getting a premium, and the money you said has to go to uh, uh, the school, ABSS. Right. Uh, I'm being technically accurate here when I say it is going to the schools. It's just not going in the time frame that we have on this. Show. Yeah, and then, but but for ACC, there's a, for this first borrowing, there's a lesser amount of premium, maybe two million. That if you take it, that's fine, but it has to be spent on ACC projects. So are you thinking that we couldn't do my scenario? Or are you thinking it's against the law from what, what we're thinking about doing, like going to the bond market? If they're going to give us the premium, let's take the premium. We know we're going to have to come back to the same bond market in 12, 15 months, maybe two years. And maybe we can come back to the bond market at a later time and won't have to ask for so much money. We already have it in hand. You're talking about taking the premium for the community college, the maybe $2 million banking it? Well, I, normally, Brian, I, normally I would not want to take the premium. But after this scenario that he's given me, it's, it's almost incumbent that we do take the premium because if I can take it now at favorable interest rates, uh, then when I go back to the bond market to get some more money, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have a f market that's as favorable as this one. Sure. So 
as, as what he said, I'm thinking I'm I'm being technically accurate here, but I want to make sure I'm legally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. I, I think there's absolutely no problem in taking the premium, and it works in the cash flows. It's just that if there's a total of $25 million of premium, hypothetically, mm -hmm. but 23 of it is associated with the ABSS, that's where that premium has to be spent. Sure. Can't be spent on ACC projects. Right. But you could you could take the premium for the ACC project, bank it, and then in September of uh, 21, mm -hmm. which would be our next borrowing, you may I don't you may get another premium then if you wanted to take it then also and bank it and see where you're at in September of 22 with interest rates and the premium that you banked, you may not have to borrow as much money. That that is a possibility, but it it. The premium generated from the bond sale for ACC has to be used with um, ACC projects. Right. That's used use for the projects. For right. ACC for projects. ACC projects. projects. Yeah. But yeah. you've already established the need through basically 2024. Uh, why, are, why are we not bidding those projects and going ahead with them? Because we know the interest rate is now roughly 2% and maybe five or higher percentage points at that at, in two to three years. Yeah, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can't speak to the bidding of the projects, but... Um, Dr. Gaywood, have you... Uh, <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, but, yeah. but can we not move on okay. with some of these while the interest rates are very, very favorable? Chair Page, the members of the commission, thank you for calling on me. <laughs> I am going to... <laughs> The answer is uh, I am not certain, but I have our chief financial officer here who may be able to assist with that. I will say that we staged the project for a number of reasons. Uh, one is just the um, the logistics around students and classes and trans getting students in and out and faculty and staff. And we have a, a, an arduous state process with which we have to uh, comply and that may have had something to do. Matt, would you please come up? Yes. Matt Banco. By the way, I have this is Matt Banco, our chief financial officer. And virtually we have Tom Hartman, who is joining us, who is the uh, director of facilities, buildings, and all of that. And so he may be able to add to this too. No, I think he's up back here. Sure, I think he said it well. We, um, we're still closing out the, the one of the bigger projects. Um, is the Public Safety Training Center. And we're at near the end of, of the, that process and getting the lease finalized and then we'll have to do an environmental. Um, but before that, before we can issue the bonds, um, we'll have to have the designer in place and ready to go. Right now we can't pay the designer because we don't have a signed lease. So once he goes through it, we'll value engineer some, and you know, we may have to value engineer some of that project we're probably looking at another year before we can have bids in hand for that $10 million project. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, did I say that well? I oh, you did, Matt. And, and the other thing that Dr. David mentioned that is uh, probably one of the bigger reasons too is just the state process. Uh, we can't even uh, sign a designer contract until uh, the projects are approved by the uh, North Carolina Community College State Board. And um, that's, that has several steps in the process as well. We have to have the, the lease in place in order for us to even be authorized to move forward on that project. I, I do see an opportunity on the tail end. There's two $500,000 uh, issuances that maybe that makes sense um, to, to uh, take the premium now on that million dollars for the east and west satellites. Um, because the issuance costs for and the interest rates may be not as favorable as now. It's not a big chunk, but it's it's a million dollars of uh, author authorization. Um, so so maybe there's some room short of you know the whole 15 million that may make a lot of sense. Yeah, I thought he was on my team. Which well, the premium much sooner. <laughs> If there is a premium, we could certainly use it to assist us in equipping, equipping the building. If you think about the building in terms of what's affixed to it, 
and you turn it upside down and you shake it, what falls out is what we have to find uh, from funds that we can include together uh, that's not included in this bond project. And those are exactly the types of equipment that students need to learn on and teachers need to teach. Biotechnology, histotechnology, agricultural biotechnology, and medical laboratory technology, and the life sciences, we'll have other labs in that space, require very expensive equipment. And when we were discerning what we would ask the public to finance for us to approve in a bond measure. We kind of did it on the cheap. And we said, well, what we can do is perhaps we can find grants and other sources of funding. When well, there's been no state funding available for these purposes, we get about $1 million a year for equipment for, and that's for all of our programs, that's, which means that there's not much to go around. So I don't know if I'm out of order or what, but I do need to make certain that you are aware that we need to put the right kinds of equipment in there to support companies such as LabCorp, who is one of our number one partners in the life sciences business. I also want to add that the life sciences business uh, industry is growing by leaps and bounds. It was projected to grow before the virus, but the virus has triggered a, 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 a tremendous amount of growth. And this, I don't believe this will go away because now we know that things, are, things can happen to us that maybe we didn't have in the front of our thinking just a couple of years ago. But it's so real now that biotechnology companies are really making huge investments. We believe that this building of course, the building is nothing without all those programs I mentioned, but it will help to attract business and industry here that we don't already have. Last point I want to make, I hope maybe it's the last, um, so let me say another point that I want to make is when you invest in Alamance Community College, every dollar you invest, the return on that investment is $4.40. The annual economic impact, and it's going up. These are the figures we have, so that's what I would use is $200 million a year. So wh however you decide to use whatever premium we may get, please know that it is not just money sitting dormant. It is, it is really having an impact on our economy, our workforce, and our, and our people. So. Of the money that you're estimating at this point, and mm -hmm. estimating is a bad word, I'm sure. <laughs> I know what uh, it means. Though. For accountants, <laughs> um, what number are you looking, particularly for the body center? You mean in terms of the equipment? The equipment, yes. Five million dollars worth of equipment. And is there any chance of obtaining grants or we have, uh, mm -hmm. investments by LabCorp and others? Here's the thing, and Matt is more positive than me. The way he shook his head. <laughs> The reality is that we've, we've actually received uh, a $1 million from LabCorp. And that's, that's a very generous uh, grant, if you will. And we have fundraised another $100,000 from the uh, Alamance Economic Development uh, found it, uh, Board. Uh, interestingly enough, we had a, um, a family foundation to it was fifty thousand dollars just recently, within the last couple of weeks. However, you can't use a total fifty-four equipment. In the wet stage, you can use twenty-five thousand half of that for equipment. We have applied for an economic development grant, but grants, when it comes to applying for a grant, there's no guarantee. We have a lot of competition for these grants, and just the smallest thing can cause you to get it or not get it, uh, a particular grant. So we have quite a few irons in the fire, but we don't have a guarantee of $2.8 million. That would uh, get us a long ways on 
having something to fall out when we turn that building upside down and shake it. <laughs> but really, it, again, it, it's a big deal for us. Roll members. I have one last question. Matt, don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> With this $1.9 trillion federal bill that just passed, yes. what impact will it, that have upon you and then Dr. Benson? Uh, hopefully we'll get an answer from you guys on the same issue. So I'm, I believe it stated that um, about half of those funds will have to go directly to students. We're just, it's going to flow through us and go right into the hands of students. Don't hold me, and half right, I believe I'm correct on that. The other we will use for impacts that are related to the virus. And we may have a, a, a little more flexibility. However, in discussions that uh, the presidents here in the state have had, we have been very, very cautious about using it for uh, capital type things. I just don't think that's what it's for. Now, if we were constructing or uh, well, modifying something already in place to make sure that people were separated and get the virus within transmit virus and the sort of that, I think it would be okay. We don't have the guidelines for that funding yet. We don't have the funding. But we are we expect to get some of it, and once we get those guidelines, then of course we would uh, decide how we use it in accordance with those guidelines. I suspect that all five of us will want to know during our April budget hearings um, how much you've received, how much you will receive if you by that time know. We should know about and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So. Uh, both ACC and ABSS. Right. Uh, those will likely be question answers that we need. Uh, critical questions. Well, certainly. Yes, ma'am. I, I need to direct. It's kind of like in addition to what Billy was saying. I'm not near smart. Yeah. You know, um, but it's it's going to be pertaining to Dr. Thorpe and the school system also. Um, today I saw where there was like an 860,000 job loss record for February. It very disappointing, it was very surprising. Our gas prices are going up. Um, I read today where we're going to probably have the highest tax increase from the new administration since 1993. I read that. And I mean, just all this money keeps dropping out of the sky and it is not free because those above lines are going to end up paying for all this. And when it was talking about the high school, when I was asking about the construction manager, because I went through all this with you guys, you know, the last couple of years, two by fours are going off, and sheetrock is going, everything's going to go up, which means that 67 mm, price may change as well. With the construction manager, will, will they eat that difference without losing a tennis court? You know, I was all about the tennis courts. Because you don't build a high school like that and people drive up and go, oh, they don't have tennis courts. Oh, where's their softball field? You know, you got to do it right if you're going to do it. Just like Dr. Gaten was talking about the equipment. You know, you got Tylenol, then you got Equate. <laughs> and they're not the same. They really aren't. I, I want something that's really designed to take for a headache, not just something to get off the counter that says, here you go, it's just a substitute. So I'm just curious about all these things that we're looking at because I'm, I'm not going to touch the public and add one more dime to them because they've already about gave us their kidney in the bonds which I was so supportive of and still am and because I want the best for our young people that's our future you've got to invest in them but I just don't want to see when we start building we have to start going oh we can't do that now no we can't do that now that half blank type of work is just unacceptable because you get half blank kind of experience and professionalism and everything else. You know, I don't, you know, I mean, it's like me watching Grey's Anatomy and then I'll, I'll do your brain surgery tomorrow. I got this. You know, that's just not how I don't operate that way. And so I'm just curious, how are we going to absorb these additional costs because I know you're going to, it's going to hit you too because if you're building anything and I get it you're like landlocked you can't just do it all at one time right. I get it so and less than 
25 words, Dr. Thorpe. How would you explain that? <laughs> 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 so I'm going to write out a kick. Less than 25 <laughs> words, okay. He's had eight right, years you, <laughs> you know this at my first rodeo, which uh, is a good <laughs> thing at this point. Uh, fortunately, we have valued and engineered. Mm -hmm. We have put alternate projects out there. Uh, one is LED lights on the biofield versus traditional lights. Uh, we have got enough alternates built in that we feel very comfortable. We're going to come in well within budget. Okay. Now, once the CMR locks into their final price, that's their baby. They have to bring it into us at or below that price. Now, we have a contingency fund that we both have to agree. You know, let's just say we get into it and we decide we want marble tops on the counters. You know me, Pam, I'll never ask for marble tops on the counter. <laughs> but it we took just, me eight years to get rid of that pink thing and <laughs> come back so You were true, saying, but I got rid of it for you. Rid of it. <laughs> but, you know, if we decide, okay, it would be really a really good idea to do that. We can both agree to take some of that contingency money and put it towards there. Now, what's great with our CMR contract, at the end of the day, we're going to split any money that's left over. So out of that contingency fund, I think it was 60 40 don't hold me to that. It's been over a year since I looked at that contract. There's a split. The contractor will walk away with their portion. We'll walk away with our portion. So that would be more money we could put back to other things. And kind of like when we're getting close to the end of the project, if we see, you know, really we need extra concrete going to the ball fields, we can grab our contingency money there and say, we're going to do that while we're here because it's cheaper to do it while we're on site. So with the CMR projects, once we lock into that final price, we are locked in. Now your operating costs, since the hospital has never even existed, that's going to be part of your new budget, right? Correct. Correct. That would have to be it. And it's going to be similar to Southern, Eastern, you know, that's a similar size school. Yeah. So you're going to have a similar operating budget as far as your support staff and stuff such as that, custodial staff, those things. I know, I don't talk small numbers. Everything and you got, got is this long. Your numbers are yes, this long. Yes, ma'am. You know, this is even longer on the back row, trust me. <laughs> it's a long way. Go see, I know <laughs> Pam, John, and Steve's all had an opportunity to walk with me and see our buildings. Mm -hmm. I've offered Bill, and I, you know, Craig, you're more than welcome to contact me anytime. We'll walk the buildings, and Steve and John will definitely tell you I'll take you to the dark side. Yeah. Uh, I'll take you to the side that nobody sees but is very instrumental in our project staying up, our school staying up and staying running. Uh, when you look at our electrical, HVAC, those type items. Um, the I'm basement under the auditorium at Williams. Sir? So the basement under the auditorium Yes, sir. That or the basement of <laughs> Pleasant Grove. Either one will scare you to death. There was a groundhog under the stoop at Andrews Elementary looking back at us. That's true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. I remember that. So, I mean, there's... I'm more than happy to take you because I'm going to show you the good, the bad, and the ugly. John was with me with the uh, legal agreement to get roofs put on schools. We have finished the last one. Uh, it was a Stevens roof. It was a bad roofing material. Uh, but during that time, we went through a lot of heartache and a lot of pain because we had rain coming in the building faster than it was going outside the building. That, that hurt. They had buckets everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Now you go in those schools and they're beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. We did a lot of extra work, was able to clean them up, make do a lot for those Cummins and Broadview especially, got rid of skylights, made it pretty in the ceilings, was able to do a whole lot for them. And some people say, well, pretty, what's pretty? Well, it makes students feel better. You know, well, I want them to feel good. You feel good in this place. It's clean, it's nice. Um, yeah, well, normally two guys goes through. I'd love to go back through again. It's been a, two years, I guess, almost. All you have to do is call me. Steve Williams is still with me. My old okay, man, I used to call him. Steve is still with me. He's great about taking people around. I'll go with you every opportunity I get. Uh, there'll be definitely places I want to make sure you see. One thing I don't want to see is us trying to save money and splitting with the contractor and then winding up with sinking concrete like at Broadview and roof issues and, and whatever so I one see thing you I guys promise you in the five, like five six years I've been doing this for the county we've not cut corners we've not wasted money thank you we went as tight as we could on stuff but uh, I've got some sidewalks coming out right now because I'm not happy with the poor wow. uh, strictly on the contractors dime so yes we are watching projects watching money uh, watching everything we can 
Now, I'm going to jump a little bit into the premiums you were talking about. May I finish up? Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, here's mine. Go ahead, here's mine. <laughs> so, let me see. No, no. I just wanted to make one Todd, more point. Todd, apparently your, your time limit ran out. Five words or less. Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, Commissioner Thompson reminded me that Tom Hartman is with us, and Tom was going to speak very quickly to a question that you triggered my thinking about, and that is the price escalation. Tom, can you hear me? I can hear you. And then yeah, we'll get out of the way. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, basically, just to, it somewhat uh, talks about uh, some of the things that Todd was talking about, but uh, um, again, we are looking at the, the, the cost uh, that may, may be increasing and probably will be increasing, material costs, et cetera. And uh, the construction manager uh, on our project, on the Center of Excellence, has already budgeted, of course, for escalation. That's in the budget number now. Um, but one other thing that, that happens with our project, it's, a, it's under the purview of the um, state construction office. State construction requires us to bid the project at 90% of the construction cost and that 10% is alternates. And the purpose of that is uh, if the bids do uh, get out of line, you still have a project. You'll have a 90% construction project. But that's where the, uh, the bond premiums can also be uh, of assistance as well because we would like to build 100% of the project. But again, we've got those, those uh, levers in place, one being the escalations already built into the project from the construction manager's budget. And then two, state construction requires us to bid it out at 90%. So, uh, and, and Todd already explained how the uh, uh, guaranteed maximum price works with the uh, uh, the uh, CM as well. So, Thank you. hope that helps. Thank I'm you. I'm honored Thank that you. I would trigger you to think anything. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. I can move back where I was at. <laughs> uh, just when you start talking about the premiums, I mean, I know that's a big decision for five people to have to make. Uh, but some things that I want to bring your attention to, and I'd love to show you if we have time between now and that, now and that period of time, April 5th. There's several things with our school system that we need to address, needed to have been addressed, should have been addressed years ago. Uh, and COVID really brought it out big time uh, is our HVAC systems. Our HVAC systems in many of our schools are antiquated. Uh, in our central office alone, which is one of our smaller buildings, there's seven different forms of HVAC in one building. Uh, there's no way to, I'll pick on my office, uh, I'm upstairs. We have heat and we have air. The two shall never cross. <laughs> Plus, the heat is radiant heat, which you cannot filter. Uh, it is forced air. Now, there are ways around that. You could turn the air system on and let it run at a lower speed, blah, blah, blah. But then that's a major cost as far as on your electrical bill. You know, we have schools that still have radiant heat and forced air. Uh, Williams High School, the bowler, original, sitting in the mm -hmm. basement. Uh, yeah, everybody's panicking about that bowler blowing up or going bad. I'm not worried about that. I can get a temporary unit in if we have to to take care of that piece. What I'm concerned about in our walls, we got steam pipes that are blowing apart. Uh, when you go through and you see the plaster oh my gosh. falling off the walls, mm -hmm. most of the time there's a steam pipe somewhere in that, uh, that chase that has sprung a leak and the plaster gets wet and it comes off. We can repair it a hundred times, yeah. but until we can tear into it and have the funds to quickly get it resolved, you know, that's not a possibility. Um, you know, we've run some cost estimates. Uh, a big thing too, we looked at was windows. Beg your pardon? Windows. Many of our windows are original to the building. Single pane. Uh, you hear people say they won't open. Well, sometimes they won't open because we can't buy parts for those particular windows. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have been actually screwed shut with permission from the fire uh, marshal because there's a possibility of lead paint with younger children. So if they're not opening and closing, we can contain it. When they open and close, it has a tendency to chip. Right. So there's a lot of reasons we do what we do, but with that funds, and I, I guess it's a tough decision, there's a lot that we can do for our school system quickly 
instead of waiting over another 10 year period because things are failing now that we should have been able to address. Um, you know, a couple things on our list is even asphalt. Uh, and I'll pick on EM Ho and AW because I've heard from law enforcement uh, since school started, and rightfully so, because those schools weren't built for 300 parents to bring their kids to school. You know, I commend the sheriff and his guys and say how we patrol for trying to help us out, but it's even dangerous for them to be in some of those intersections. Uh, DOT has come out and we've done evaluations. And what can we do? It would make sense to put a turn lane in or to put a holding area in our campuses? Well, they value engineer, which is the least expensive and the most effective. But in both those cases, it's to put asphalt down on our property. There's also a general statute out there that talks about two things. One, if funding's available and we put asphalt down on the campus, it's a reimbursement. Uh, two, if it's a bus lot, it's the state's responsibility to help us to continue to pave it because it's a much heavier grade asphalt. So we can actually capitalize on those two things. They won't pay you up front, and it may take you a year to get your money, but we can make an immediate investment, correct an issue that would be a major safety issue for our families. Then we, you know, that money's coming back, then we can decide do we spend the money twice? Can we take the money and do other improvements or is it something that you can put in the budget? Is it something you can put directly back to the bonds? Uh, you know, roofing, right now if you ask me how much roofing needs to need, I'm gonna take a little over $13 million. It's not cheap to put, it's not cheap to put a roof on a building. Typically, um, Seller's Gun was the last one I did. It was $770,000. Broadview was, right at a million, Cummins was right at a million. So when you start talking about putting a roof down, it's not cheap. Now, out of no fault of anybody in the past, but we do not have a replacement plan on roofs. It would make sense for somebody to come to the county and say, we need $3 million every year just for roofs. Roofs were replaced just when they were like Broadview, when they were beyond typical repair. Where if you say a roof is gonna last you about 25 years, uh, with 39 buildings, uh, 40 buildings talking about our one room schoolhouse, and if you heard, we're gonna renovate it, which I'm excited about that, small mm -hmm. renovation. Um, there's, what, three, four campuses we should be doing a year? Almost to stay caught up. Some of them will be very economical, and some of them have metal roofs, so you don't ever have to touch them again. So, I mean, that, that number would change, but just using math, and I'm not very good at math, but it was probably over calculating it out for me exactly how many square foot of roof I'd have to do. But, uh, there it was. <laughs> I'm going to throw, throw a variance in there. I can't give it to you. It's the metal. We got several metal roofs. But they still have to be maintained. They still have to have their work done as well as the others. So there's a lot of things that we can talk about. Uh, the ones that know me, if I tell you I'm going to do it, it's going to get done. And you know, I love to bring things in under budget, but done correctly. And I give you budget numbers always to cover that because I want it done correctly. That's first and foremost. Uh, I don't know, I've heard you talk about grandchildren. I know I have people in there. I got two pre-K kids, uh, grandkids, not kids, grandkids. <laughs> uh, I do have one of those with me, at Smith. And you know, my, my goal is, I don't want to send any kid to a school my kid couldn't go to school to. So yeah, if you really, if you got time, get up with me, we'll go look. I'll talk you through some of the stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll be as blunt as I can. Well, I ask Steve, I'll just tell you like it is, and I don't know any other way to do it. Perfect. But we do have things that we could possibly talk about spending that money on that would be a great investment for our kids, our teachers, and our school buildings. Oddly enough, that board at Williams High School, when I was on the board in 2014, was an item that we discussed and talked about financing and so forth. So uh, it, it's, 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 been, it it's been beat up so much, but like I said, you can bring <laughs> a temporary bowler in fairly quickly. Uh, I'm more worried about the steam line. If, even if we brought a bigger one in, if we put more pressure on the steam lines. Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we could have even bigger issues. Uh, the good thing about it is we do have a, a I'm going to say a new chiller, but a decent chiller at Williams, and we do have the AV boxes. Uh, we'd have to get with the engineers to see if we can capitalize on that side of the system. It may bring the heat in a different method. 
Uh, it, it's not anyway. It's not going to be cheap. The number they've told me is about twenty-five dollars per square foot. Anytime you start messing with HVAC on the industrial level, uh, twenty-five to thirty dollars, depending on how complex it is. Uh, our windows, you know, Williams. I'm picking Williams and Turn Top. Look why they're on my mind today. Other than I've been there twice today, that might have something <laughs> to do with it. Uh, when they put air conditioning in the buildings, the thing to do at that time was stick those panels over top of glass and metal. It was temporary. That was in the 90s. Uh, now what's behind those panels, I'm scared to say. Uh, I can imagine a lot of rust, a lot of nasty, don't know what condition those windows are behind those panels. Uh, have, haven't removed them because once you start removing them, now you got to remediate whatever you find. So just you know, some opportunities there. Uh, if we can do a balanced HVAC, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up so much time, but I can talk about these buildings day and night if you want to. <laughs> uh, if we could do a balanced HVAC with fresh air induction coming into our buildings, we could adjust the humidity, we could take the mold and mildew out of the buildings, uh, make it a lot more comfortable. And safer. And safer. And actually, uh, your cost to run the buildings may even get to be cheaper because you can use a balance instead of just trying to fight what you fight. Like during the summer, we just got cold air blowing. We're just fighting hot. We're not dealing with the humidity. If we had the ability to bring fresh air into the buildings, we could do a balance with the cold, with the fresh air to balance the humidity in the buildings. And they would feel cooler mm -hmm. and maybe not have the temperatures down to 68 to 70 degrees to try to make them comfortable. And then also zoning of the buildings. Right now, many of our buildings, when they turn down, we heat or cool every inch of square footage. Uh, with a new HVAC, we look at new controls, uh, taking those controls and fixing where we can zone buildings, which would make good sense. If during the summer only the office being used, we run the office. If wing A or B, C, whatever number it is, is being cleaned, we could run it. Then once it's finished, switch and flip it to where you're not cooling 3.5 million square feet or heating 3.5 million square feet every time we fire them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Albright, I would request, Mr. Albright. Yes. I would request that we look at this new federal bill, the $1.9 trillion, uh, and see, one, how those monies can be spent. Uh, right. Can we apply any of that to capital projects and things of that sort, particularly with school needs, ACC and ABSS? Okay. Thank you. I really hope we can get to a point where our schools, who house the most important part of our future, are not just hit or miss fixed. Because um, when you walk into a new building, it doesn't have to be outstanding, all glass, all this stuff, but simple things like heating and air work, or our house does, hopefully, not all homes do, but you know what I'm saying? Because it just seems like we have to pick the cheapest way and get by the easiest way we can and we'll get it later and we just seem to pay for it two and three times. You know how I was obsessed with paint and lights. Mm -hmm. And paint can change everybody's attitude when you walk into a school. Lights you can actually see. There was a teacher downstairs We told me she would have not retired if they had fixed the lights down there soon enough because it was like walking candlelit. Kids don't need romantic, they need right where they can see. <laughs> Now we have LEDs everywhere. And it's amazing, so. and at the way it saves and it's long lasting. So um, it's all in the mindset. And I know um, anything associated with the word T A X can be like the word S I N. And um, I just I just want us to realize how important it is to provide a really safe, sound structure for the young people. And I, mm. I'm I'm just so glad kids are back at school because that we have the eyes and ears for children. And uh, and it's just a blessing. It all goes together. And um, it's like equating and Tylenol. <laughs> I, want, I want kids to have every opportunity because um, the kids you least suspect could invent the cure for cancer if he's just given the opportunity. And um, that, that's it. Pam, we definitely don't need romantic lining in high school. No. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> they do okay. With, Fine, just by themselves. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, a couple questions. Yes, sir. Uh, as I understand, if the board decides to take some bond premium, that those do we have to have a good faith basis to believe that we can spend that money within three years. Mm -hmm. um, do you have? Does your office have a priority list of those projects that you want to complete 
uh, and the budget for completing those mm -hmm. projects within three years that are outside of the nine major projects that are already yes sir okay some of them cross over into the same projects we're doing with bond like Williams High School, you heard me speak a bit with HVAC and the windows. So some will cross back over into where we've put some bond money into, but uh, many of them are isolated cases. Okay. I think it would be helpful for us to see that. Sure. I'll share all that with you. Uh, I've got rough drafts, but I'll, I'll clean it up, share it with you. Uh, there's about 50 million of immediate. How many? 50. Five zero. Five zero of immediate. Uh, well, the way we do... Outside of the 150? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> When we first started talking about bonds, we talked about three hundred million. I mean, go on. For uh, yes, uh, on the first evaluations, and I think we all got comfortable at one fifty. So yes, there's about fifty million, and that's not everything. That's the ones we are saying the most pressing. And those uh, are things like roofs, HVAC, windows, uh, just the safety with the asphalt. The yeah, those things. So okay. It's. Is it realistic to get us those numbers before we do the issuance yeah, okay. on April 5? Just, just let me, I mean, I've got them here. Let me clean yes. them up. Got a lot of notes on them. Uh, I'll share the notes with you. I, I, it's, <laughs> let me spend a little time getting them cleaned up, and I will definitely share with Brian and let him share with you. I think one of the best things years ago when I stood right there and invited the commissioners, because you were on it, John, you were instrumental in this, to get on a bus and go with us to see the schools because cost reports it's got all these numbers but until you see water pouring out of a roof and it's not there it's like a mile up the street you just you think oh, I can't believe kids have to go to school in this I mean it's, it's unbelievable and I'm not gonna sit here and say one thing or another but until you walk those halls and see things you may realize that wow we need to step it up and John was with me and it's um and it was amazing because you just don't need to see it on a piece of paper. You need to smell it. You need to hear it. You need to see it because it needs to make an impact that you won't forget it. And um, this is a lot. It's enormous. Well, and like I said, a lot of it, and some of it's even awnings just to get kids to arrive safely to and from drop-offs because right now some of them on rainy days are mm -hmm. taking umbrellas and making a run for it, and they shouldn't have to do that. It should be some sort of nice awning that they can walk under. Um, I've been at Pleasant Grove standing by the window that was shut when my hair was doing mm -hmm. this. So that tells you that the window ain't really shut. Right, so I mean, our fresh air is very fresh in our buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I said I had two questions, and technically I asked two, but I'm going to call You're the fine. second one a clarification. Yes, sir. Which was the 50, so I'm not going to count that as my question. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the other question is, we've got uh, nine major projects to do in the next couple of years. Does, do we have the capacity to manage an additional yeah. however many, you know, $50 million or $20 million, $25 million of we, projects we, we will over manage. the next three years? We will manage. We may have to bring in a contract uh, project manager, not a contracted firm, a contracted individual to help. Right now I've got one person that's uh, managing the $150 million for me along with myself. I, I help out and assist there. Um, I'm handling a lot of the roofing issues just because that's really a, it doesn't require a lot of time, it just requires a lot of energy as far as being there while they're doing some of the work. I've got two assistant maintenance directors that manage our day-to-day -day projects. So we have people, uh, like I said, we may have to bring on a, another short-term contract the project manager to assist, uh, but we can handle it. We will handle it. And then will you need the five million dollars annually for upkeep for facilities the still? Three point three. The three point three is gonna be there for years to come. You still need that if you if you spend this money. Because what happens is three point three it's a lot of money, don't get me wrong. I'm very appreciative of the money. But it's hard to do really large projects with it. Like if I sink the three point three and doing Williams windows, I don't have any money to do anything else with because I'm gonna have tile four come up somewhere. I'm gonna have roof repairs that's gonna to have to come in. I'm gonna have asphalt repairs. There's things that's gonna continuously come up. Furniture replacement, I mean, that's $150,000, $200,000 a year uh, that you don't do on large scale. You try to do it on smaller scale, and that's what we use those funds for. Right now, we've invested a lot in painting and safety vestibules. Um, 
in the next two years the safety vestibules will be finished the painting we're on really the last round of painting for a few years except for some house so some of those numbers will be freed up but then you go to the flip side of that you've got cameras you got buzz in points uh, you got other things that have a three to five year life cycle so you're going to take that money and start replacing those things you got servers on your cameras that go bad about ever three to, again three to five years so that money becomes a recycle to keep this stuff up and going so what I'm saying is and if I have the money to fix it then that money will maintain it for us does that make sense yeah okay come on one more <laughs> got a question for Mr. Albright is it possible for all five of us to be together on a tour of Pam suggested something like a bus tour where we just take a van and tour the situation or is that is that totally prohibited from you can go too mm -hmm. that way we thank can you talk about <laughs> 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 sounds like yeah. fun <laughs> uh, we'd have to take Tommy with us wouldn't we <laughs> you'd, have yes. to, you'd have to let Thomas drive the bus uh, you, you could have a special meeting to do that certainly but I, I just don't think it's a good idea for more than two to be together at any right. one time. Even if the press goes with us? No, I said if Thomas goes with you, just have a special meeting, yeah. just take a tour of the schools yeah. and let Thomas drive the bus. He's sitting over there shaking his head no. <laughs> that, that would not violate the open meetings law. It would not. So that's good. You could do that. Correct. You would go with us, wouldn't you? He looks real excited about it. <laughs> I'll take him in the basement if you those places. He'll stay on the bus from that point forward. I think that's a good idea because at the same time, the tenants see the well, get it. I think we, we, we work off each other well, and you might think of a question that I might not think of, but we'd all benefit from the answer. And uh, If you give me some dates, I'll line us up a bus and see if I can't line up the people. Mr. Hager, uh, would you arrange that? Certainly. And I would, would suggest like with ACC and with Alamance Burlington mm -hmm. school system. Would the commissioners like to do that before April 5th? You want to try to get that in, or is that? I think that'd be a I good idea. As soon as possible. Okay. Well, Just call me more. We'll sure. see what we'll do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm still doing fine and ready to rock and roll, but I keep seeing people walk out to the restrooms. Do we need to take a break is the question. Let's yes. Take a 10 minute recess. Yes. Right. We'll take a 10 minute <laughs> recess. Uh, it is yes, now 8.57, 8 so we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Here we go, so I'll, yes. I'll even call it in session. We're in session. <laughs> yes, sir. Awesome. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we had a few takeaway points. If there's no other questions, which there certainly is time if you, if you have more questions, but some of the takeaway points were uh, to run some scenarios with less property tax revenue in the scenarios. Um, also mm -hmm. to uh, look at uh, ABSS is going to share uh, their list of um, 20 plus million dollar project lists with the commissioners. And then um, Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Gatewood will work through myself and Tori to schedule uh, some tours between now and April 5th for the commissioners to go with press and attendance so everyone can go that can go to tour school system sites and the community college site. Uh, and I think that's that's the main takeaways and you know hopefully what what we'll hear from the commissioners on the 5th maybe after you, you, you see these new scenarios you get a chance to look at school system facilities and college facilities uh, we'll be listening on the fifth for some guidance about what you what you think is the right thing to do about the premiums in particular, and then you know we can talk further as we go through budget about how you feel about cash flow and the plan. But I think the 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 key piece is the coming debt issuance. How how do you want to handle the premium? So I mean, Ted, would you? Would yeah, you, I think that's a great takeaway. Good summation. Does that sound reasonable to the board? I think so. I think Additionally, so. we have the uh, agenda meeting the Wednesday preceding the meeting on the 5th. So if we could do the uh, tours prior to that agenda meeting, not necessarily you know, uh, compelling us to do that, but it would, I think, help um, the two of us, particularly the rest of this board, to set that agenda for sure. April 5th. I think I agree with you, John. I think the sooner the better. Give us time to start thinking about what we need to do. We'll do. And I want to thank all you folks 
excellent presentation and uh, unfortunately too many needs. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I assume we're down to Miss Evans. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, before you tonight, I'm requesting an approval for a capital project ordinance, which will be the second amendment to the ACC capital project ordinance. Um, this is to budget pro the um, project cost of the Public Safety Center project in the amount of $10,400,000. Um, we are estimating a bond issuance cost of $250,000. I will say that that is an estimate at this time. And when these bonds are issued in the spring of, um, I believe, 2021, 2022, then we will adjust those at that time. But this will allow us to go ahead and reimburse the community college for some upfront costs that they have. Any discussion? Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. I'll second. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Carries without objection. And I'll hand this around for signatures. Thank you. Sheriff Johnson, the, the high sheriff. Thank you. Oh, hi, you. Well, the high meaning honorable. Oh. <laughs> I was out to take drugs. <laughs> I'm appearing for uh, the uh, commissioners tonight. I don't know if you have had much of an opportunity to ride over this county, but the trash is, is uh, terrible. Uh, been thrown alongside the road. Matter of fact, about 4.30 this afternoon, Mr. F.D. Hornet, he called me. <laughs> Raising cane that somebody had thrown a washer, a dryer, and a TV set out at one of his driveway gates uh, to his property. Was that not a donation? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him you said it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but... If you haven't had a chance, I, I wish you'd ride the county roads and look. But what I'm proposing is to, uh, under statute 162-58, it says the sheriff can work inmate labor for betterment of the local government or state. And what I'd like to do is uh, bring one of our retired uh, detention officers back who was actually major over to jail to head up this project to work 20 hours a week and pay that individual $25 an hour and we will start picking up trash around this county and believe me it's going to be a bunch of it we did this uh, several months ago down there on the road uh, to our landfill and had a truck full in less than an hour hour and a half two hours I mean it was unbelievable and I've also uh, instructed my patrol officers you see trash come off the truck, you see somebody throw trash out, write them a citation. I'm fed up with it. The people are calling, raising cane with the sheriff's office. And so I have developed a trash patrol. <laughs> <laughs> we have got to do something now. And uh, I would love to, if you want to, we'll put you in a car and you can ride and look at some of the roads. It's embarrassing. Uh, I've gotten a couple of calls about that myself, mm -hmm. sure. And, Sheriff uh, Johnson, where are the signs? Used to be thousand dollars to litter. I mean, you can see them everywhere. And I mean, we get we get into the habit of making better choices, and then when sometimes we don't see that accountability, we're right back to where was. I remember Sammy Moser, um, his kids. He called me today. He was <laughs> talked about this months ago <laughs> last year, being very passionate about it. I'm, I'm just glad because you know. We, you, this is, it's just sorry to throw trash out of your car. There's no excuse for it. Well, this is my home county, and I want it pretty. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we have dealt with some. I know uh, two years ago, a guy came off his raising cane and uh, about the Governor Scott Road between Cherry Lane Drive mm -hmm. and 119. And I went th that road to see what he was talking about, and it was filthy and I just happened to find a bag and I went into the bag and found an address and a person's <laughs> name and I went and knocked on his door just around the corner at 119 and I said told him I said got a choice 
clean that road up or I'm going to give you a citation. Next day, you could eat off that road. <laughs> <laughs> he picked everything and a lot what he had to throw down. And, you know, we've got to do something. We can't continue to allow this to happen. Can I ask you one more question? Are these trustees? Do we? Will the trustees be being part of this? They can program? be trustees or they can be low class misdemeanors and not an escape risk. Okay. And one other thing does community service for this handed down, like if you charge with something and you get this plus 50 hours of community service, can that population be funneled into this as well? Uh, I talked to uh, Judge Allen about that and he says that he don't have the authority to okay. do that. I, okay. uh, Why does he not? Mr. Albright? Uh, well, the <laughs> state has a statute that says what type of prisoners can be worked. and. Uh, that's what he's. I think that's what the judge is referring to. We used them once before. See what? When what, we cleaned up the Adam Lamb what, property. Yeah, I remember that. And we had them out at the landfill, because we had 264 dump truck loads of trash off that man's <laughs> property. Oh, you and got them bigger sorted, than that down on Barbie. Well, they. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. not quite that big. They, they sorted for I think two or three weeks, and the deputy was out there yeah. uh, with them. They did a great job. Mr. What, Albright, would you work with the sheriff and? And, sure. and and the judicial system what? and I, work something out. I talked to uh, Judge Allen about, in, you know, instead of giving people time for DWI on the weekends, mm -hmm. put, you know, let them pick up trash. Uh, come in uh, yeah. Saturday morning or Friday morning, certain two days a week, uh, and pick up trash. And he said he didn't think he had the authority to do that. And so we, we used a volunteer back, back in that <clears throat> time, as I recall, we weren't allowed to do to have a judge sentence them because I wanted to do that with the child support people. And uh, actually, yeah. you, you go into the jail and say, which one of you boys want to go outside today? And you get more volunteers oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. than yeah. you can shake a stick at. And they did an excellent job. They sorted steel, <laughs> copper, uh, uh, wire, and cost us 26000 to clean it up, but we made fourteen <laughs> in recycled <laughs> materials. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, and, th and they... They're anxious to get out and do things like that. I do you? Remember, do you, I'm go sorry, ahead. go ahead, Joe. Whenever I was at Family Services downtown, Lexington Avenue, um, we had to get all that stuff out of, you don't know, when people donate to you, you get everything. And whenever we had to move to the Family Justice Center, I called you and you sent some of your folks uh, over there with a real nice lady that had a gun. And they moved out everything, and we ordered pizza and Coke and Diet Coke. These are the nicest guys ever. They just maybe made some bad choices like we all do. But um, they were wonderful. I mean, they really were. Be surprised what a pizza would do. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without that's them. Because, you know, nonprofit, we didn't have any money to hire anyone. Mm -hmm. So it was just a, it was a blessing. It really was. What we'd have to do, you know, and like I say, buy pizzas, a hamburger or something, serve them on the road. We've already had donated from the Department of Transportation and the Porter John with a trailer to pull it. We've got trucks to mm -hmm. load the trash in and uh, you're looking at probably th uh, three officers out on the road, one driving the truck, two watching the inmates. Yeah. Is Coley going to be kind of that person? Uh, Alan Miles is oh, one that's, yeah, yes. that's uh, one come back. You can't Alan, lose, uh, you can't lose anyone that, so. Uh, so. Need a motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Lashley. Oh, I just had a simple Sorry. question, uh, just Please. informational. Do the inmates get paid for this job? Do they get paid for this work? No. Do they get any time off? They can be. That can be done. So no money to their canteen. But most, what you find most uh, of the inmates, they just love to get out of that jail sure. set and, and in the sunshine mm -hmm. and eat pizza and, and you know, yep. they have a good time. But we did it earlier last year, cleaning up the road uh, to the uh, landfill, and they had a blast and worked hard too. Good. You might mention too, the DOT got you some equipment to do this with. Yes, I have a Porter John and a trailer. And a truck. Uh, Any question? Uh, truck. Also, uh, I've heard, and I'm, I'm trying to get hold of uh, Mike Mills, that oh, there might be some money available to come from the state. They had told me last year. I can't guarantee that, but that's mm -hmm. what I was told. Yeah, he's retired. Is he still in position to do that? Do he oh. he retired? That's right. He retired, but uh, I know the guy that uh, took his uh, place. Yeah. A lot of the balloon rallies over the thirty plus years that I've flown competition all over the country, uh, a lot of those locations will have just the public 
um, for a particular weekend or for a period of time call in and report areas of concern. The Barbie Street property you talked about is is major, for example. Major, major. Um, and I know that the health department is doing a lot of work in that area, and we appreciate that. Um, but perhaps, uh, Mr. Albright, I would request that you meet with um, possibly um, some of the judges, uh, the sheriff's department, Mr. Haygood. Let's determine what we can do. We, we have the general statutes, which are in our packets for today. Um, but I would really encourage that. I think a lot of these folks might volunteer, as I wink, to uh, do some volunteer work as part of their uh, sentencing, maybe continue a sentence for a, a month or so, or <laughs> even if it's you know, not uh, people in custody. Well, let me talk to uh, Judge Allen. He, district court is where you have most of your guests yes. at the hotel. And Mr. Maynard. And I'll talk to Judge Allen to see what we can see what we can come up with. I truly appreciate it. But you know, the call-in situation, uh, I'm sure that some of the radio stations would volunteer to give you uh, time on the radio. I've heard yeah. you call in. You, <laughs> you, you ride the county. You don't have to call in. Every one of the roads is trash as I've ever seen. I understand. I'm telling you. We appreciate it. It's your embarrassing. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's a good thing you're doing that. We need a vote on this, uh, Mr. Yeah. Vote of support. Uh, the uh, show of support would be would be nice. Mm -hmm. right. Do we have a motion? Uh, I made a motion. I thought I heard a second. Yeah, I second. Bill is second. All right. All in favor of supporting the sheriff, the county attorney, the county manager, and others, possibly the health department and uh, and recreation and parks, who both directors are here, uh, to join this effort. Um, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Sheriff Johnson. <laughs> See, you guys should have been hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think, uh, Ms. Evans, again, you have the... Okay. I'm going to remove that this time. It's a little bit easier to communicate. Um, so tonight before you commissioners, I am bringing a revised travel policy for your approval. Um, the last time that our travel policy was approved and revised was back in 2009. So there have been a lot of changes that we have needed to have made to our travel policy. Um, two of our major changes that we've had in the policy is dealing with meal reimbursement and lodging. Um, our current per diem rate for an employee who is traveling on behalf of the county to go to a conference um, or even to travel out of state for county business is $30. Um, and we've talked earlier about inflation costs. And it's hard for some employees, depending on where they're having to travel to, to be able to be sustained on $30 for a per diem. So what our policy would request is that we go from a $30 per diem to follow GSA, which is the U.S. General Service Administration for our travel destination to set that daily rate. Um, what their rate would be for North Carolina would be $55 a day, and that breaks down to $13 for breakfast, $14 for lunch, $23 for dinner, and $5 for incidental. So if they had parking or tips or anything else that would incur cost, that would be their incidental. They would receive that $55 per day, and that would sustain them. Um, within our policy, if someone was traveling, say, multiple days, on their first and last day of travel, they would not receive that $55. They would receive $41.25, because normally if someone is leaving the day before a conference would start on Monday, depending on what time that conference would start, they would not need that full day of sustaining. They would only need a partial day. Um, what this policy also relies on is that if a meal is included within the conference pricing, they would not be reimbursed for those lunches. So this would only be for meals that would not be covered by a conference registration. Um, another major change that we are experiencing deals with the lodging. Um, a lot of our conferences, and the health department can attest to this, is that there are conferences that employees need to be at longer than 5 o'clock. And if a conference is going into, say, 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night, 
and then the employee is having to travel back and then if the conference begins back at eight o'clock it was more beneficial for that employee to be able to stay on site and take advantage of all of the conference has to offer and bring that information back to Alamance County and enrich our departments so that is another change that we are asking for is that for employees that would be traveling um, to the counties that are listed most of our conferences happen in Wake County Orange County UNC um, School of Government is there and they offer very advantaged classes for us to take and that some of those classes would be beneficial for for our employees to be able to stay overnight in those counties as well those are our major um, changes that we're asking for in our policy there were a few um, minor changes and one of that is that the travel advances would come to the finance department versus HR um, prospective employees would not be reimbursed under this because this po policy would be just for county employees um, as I said tippings parking fees and tolls they are all reimbursed under the GSA um, reimbursement rate our policy um, prior to 2009 allowed for an emergency home call that with the county would pay for long distance most of everyone now has a cell phone so we would remove that language from the policy um, and then the completion of forms we have that and we specified that if a member of our staff needed to travel and you know sometimes a spouse will tag along because of the destination it may be close to a family member or there may be an event that they want to take advantage of there that the employee is responsible for any um, traveling fees for a spouse a child or someone that's traveling with them You hadn't had any expenses lately, have you? We have not. <laughs> so this was a good time for us to, um, we did provide, a, get a, we had a committee that met and we talked about our current policy, what would be some good changes to see for the county. Um, but we are preparing for when travel does get to happen again um, because staff feels and management does too that when we have staff development opportunities, we're enriching our employees we're allowing them to grow and then bring that information back to our county to help make us a better county as well as co-workers in our departments let me ask you this question the roughly 16 years i was on the board of elections we were required by state law to have uh, at least two seminars per year for training mm -hmm. as board members mm -hmm. uh, will this cover board members that are going to these uh, CLAs. It does as well. This right. will also. This policy will cover. Uh, let me get that page just open up. Here we go. It will cover our um, employees, commissioners, elected officials, and appointed board members when right. travel is necessary. And employees. Mm -hmm. And employees. All right. Additionally, um, I know that with particularly with the Board of Elections and the Mental Health Board, I was chairman of and on for so many years. It required us to be at meetings, particularly Wake County, Forsyth County, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And those meetings often went till nine or, or later at night mm -hmm. and started at 8 a.m. the next morning. Um, so I think that would be very, very beneficial in those situations. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, that it is, it is that the discretion of the department head. So the department head would have to agree to that and approve all of that travel for their department. It's something like, say, um, Family Justice Center, the Diversion Center, mm -hmm. the Jack, that kind of thing. That's under a grant. County don't, the grant pays for that, right? That's, That's correct. included in their grant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Mr. Haygood. Uh, commissioners, this item that I'm going to discuss with you does not require any vote or any kind of approval. This is an information item only. Uh, the county is purchasing a new crash truck for Alamance County Rescue. This vehicle uh, was financed through the fiscal year 1920 budget. Uh, the total loan amount for the truck and its equipment is $923,000. $990.07. That's the principal total. The uh, interest total is $76,009.93. Annual payment by the county is $100,000 and it has been financed for 10 years. 
there's an agreement in your packet between Alamance County Government and Alamance County Rescue with, that indicates that county government will own the vehicle uh, until the debt is repaid. So county government will own it, rescue will operate it. Uh, the intent is after the vehicle is paid off, uh, it will be titled to Alamance County Rescue. Um, rescue could help pay off the vehicle early if they're able to uh, raise some additional funding and want to make that available, that would be wonderful. Rescue's responsibilities through this agreement will be to ensure that their operators are properly trained and licensed to drive this vehicle. Uh, they will be responsible also for its care and uh, the care of the vehicle itself and its equipment and will name uh, Alamance County as an additional insured and will be responsible to insure the vehicle. So um, uh, there's not a vote needed, but it is, uh, we felt like it was important to let you know and I believe we have, I believe we have some rescue staff possibly. They were joining us virtually, I don't know if you see them see them still there Kyle Buckner and uh, uh, Nick Martin do you still see him Bruce uh, I didn't get any of those I got William Monty uh, I think William Monty might be uh, with rescue can can you bring him up he's, he's available is he still there he's Mr. Uh, hey good how are you sir good William I, I don't know if you wanted to be able to hear the information I was given to the commissioners about the uh, proposed agreement between the county and rescue Yes, sir. Um, just a little bit of uh, info. We do have a, a little bit of an update. The uh, process of this build was put kind of slow because of COVID last year. Um, but we do have uh, confirmation that cabin chassis part is uh, more or less completed. It will be sent to the uh, manufacturer of EVI soon for the production of the box and the utility part of it and all the functionings. So we're looking timeline if everything stays on schedule towards the end of the year october november um as late as the early november, uh, december area for this truck to truck to be in here let me ask a question mr Moni, this is pam can you tell me the difference between this vehicle as compared to a standard ambulance all oh, that's i mean because i what is this <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I'll be more than happy to explain. So what, um, as a matter of fact, I work for the county as well for under uh, Mr. Vipperman at EMS. Um, so ambulance is just is your general uh, patient care vehicle, transport the sick and the injured from, to and from home to the hospital uh, in that type of emergency. Our, our rescue truck uh, being purchased uh, by the county, helping us out with that, is for technical rescue purposes. Um, everything from heavy vehicle extrication, uh, high angle rescue, trench, trench collapse, structure collapse, um, any kind of specialized technical rescue that, uh, that requires in the county. Um, and it is a very, it's a very large vehicle as you uh, heard from the price tag of this, um, but it will encompass a lot of stuff on, on that one vehicle. It's a, it's a large toolbox on wheels more or less. Uh, big, it's all the way down each side, roof compartments, and uh, we'll be able to uh, come pretty much meet the, meet the need of the county plus some uh, was our goal with planning this uh, for a, you know, at least a 20 plus, 30 plus year um, truck for the county because uh, we are operating out of a uh, 95 uh, truck right now as our front line with our backup being a uh, 2004 smaller truck and an 85 smaller crash truck that's um, well on its way out of here. Um, but uh, the biggest difference in that is we respond to all the specialized needs of the county. Um, the fire service can provide a little bit of the extrication, a lot of some of the rescue services uh, to a, a, a smaller level, but this truck has got a lot more of the equipment on it to supplement what they have uh, and to, um, to reach out and put uh, the larger amount of equipment, the heavier duty equipment um, as, as set forth in, in the accidents and the incidents that we do run, whether it be on the highway or out in the county or in the cities. It sounds like what I watch on Wednesday's Chicago Fire. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. So. That's a pretty impressive vehicle. That's awesome. And you'll have your own special people trained for this specific truck. They already do. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Our uh, our staff, uh, I myself and my uh, my brother actually are the the two training guys for rescue. Um, we have everybody um, aside from new folks that we do bring on, and again, we are a majority volunteer. Other than our paid staff during the daytime, um, all the paid staff are fully trained, TR certified through North Carolina Fire Marshal's Office, um, and specialized in all the uh, specialties that this truck will provide. So it will be well qualified and well staffed. Many duties that we have to do. Let me ask a, an additional question. Uh, there's been confusion and telephone calls that I've received stating, oh, why do we need this rescue and whatever? Our fire departments get there first. 
and Ryan, you and I talked about that. This is not uh, what the fire department is doing. Like, explain. I think uh, I think William could speak to that very well. I know rescue spe uh, is very specialized in their response. Uh, they are uh, uh, high high angle rescue trench, uh, large vehicle crashes, uh, trailway bus, airplanes, eighteen wheelers. William, I hope I'm doing y'all justice <laughs> as I say all this. So chime right in. Uh, you're you're correct, um, Mr. Haygood. Um, so the the fire service does provide a lot of the the, the stuff to a small level. Again, their their primary um, their primary. Um, role is fire protection um, they have to respond to all the, anything fire related we don't do fire um, we do fire extinguishers that's about it um, when it comes down to it but they have provide all the uh, fire protection services for the county uh, they do have the capabilities of uh, vehicle extrication in some aspect or another um, and that's just depends on which fire department um, can and what they have equipment wise uh, but we're there to supplement them this is not something that um, this is an everyday uh, deal um, for us um, to them it's a we we, we provide any kind of backup as necessary um, as they request it or as needed um, obviously we're automatically dispatched if we're needed we're needed if we're not we're not uh, just again it depends on the scene size up and what what's out there um, the, the average day-to-day -day, um, what we call a door pop where somebody can't get out of the door because it's, it's um, dented or locked or however it's however it's stated um, can be easily done uh, in a quick fast and a hurry measure by the fire service um, but we're just there to supplement them in any necessary uh, ways um, and personnel personnel is the biggest thing you know during the daytime a lot of departments have one or two people on staff some some have a little bit more but majority of the time you don't have a lot of folks we're providing you know to at least one two probably even five up to five on our average our average day to help supplement that uh, plus whoever else is available again this is a volunteer uh, deal uh, but a lot of the average time we're giving them more more hands-on uh, more technical um, training is the biggest thing that we that we can bring to the table um, we, we concentrate on this day in and day out um, that's what our trainers do on our uh, training nights once a week and then at least one weekend every other month or so we do we are training specialized uh, on whether it be large vehicle accidents water rescue swift water rescue our dive team um, this truck will um, supplement all of that and then have that capability for us I want to thank you I, I just want everybody out in Alamance County to know this is not redundancy we're not duplicating no. uh, it's an extra service that saves lives I think Mr. Carter had a hand uh, working with rescue to help uh, Help figure out how this deal would work and uh, what type of equipment uh, would be on the truck and what the truck would be like. I'm sorry, I should have brought a picture of the truck because it's pretty impressive. The, the graphics from the company. It's going to be uh, it's going to be quite the sight seeing it come down the road. But um, basic, very, go ahead. I'm it's sorry. very impressive piece of equipment, and these these guys, Alamance County owes them a grat uh, 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 gratitude. I mean, it's what they've done in the past and what they're preparing to do for us in the future being prepared for the future in Alamance County is is uh, is amazing and uh, but they, these guys are dedicated to what they do if you go attend one of their meetings one night and get a chance to, to meet them and talk to them you find out how dedicated they are I mean these are most of them are volunteers so and it, it, as William just said there's a lot of training that goes into it and uh, a lot of knowledge they have to have they can't just show up and try and figure out how to do it when they get there <laughs> no action needed commissioner just to bring you up to speed about it and uh, we appreciate William uh, joining us tonight. Yes, thank and you. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Thank you, William. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Uh, for you tonight for the first time uh, seeking an appointment to the Recreation and Parks Commission. We do have a vacancy. We uh, advertised that vacancy and got uh, six applications for this for this opening. Uh, the Recreation and Parks Commission considered those and would like to recommend to you the appointment of Travis Sapp. Travis is a uh, Alamance County resident. He works at UNC, um, but in his off time, he's involved with our programs. He does archery instruction for us, and his children are active in our programs, so he's a good fit for our department. Um, obviously, the other uh, candidates would be excellent uh, folks to have on there, too, but our, our commission has recommended the appointment of Travis Sapp. You do have a good list of applicants here, definitely. Absolutely. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve Travis Sapp. Motion to approve. We have a second? Second. Okay. All right. 
you any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, I don't think you got away that quickly, do you? Well, there's one in between, and I'm happy to. Uh, Why don't you go ahead while I'm you're. I'm to go out of order. That's okay. All right. Uh, the first, the next thing I had was a budget amendment. So we, we're seeking permission tonight to apply for a grant, and if the grant is awarded, to amend the budget in the amount of five thousand dollars. This is a grant from the Convention Visitors Bureau. They give to local organizations to promote uh, things that are going to attract tourists. So this year we'll be at, hoping to advertise our new park at Cane Creek Mountains Natural Area, as well as um, continuing some of our promotion of the Hall River Trail. Uh, we don't need a lot of promotion this year because we've been overwhelmed. The numbers are starting to come back to normal, and as the travel season hopefully starts uh, over the course of this summer, we would love for people to choose places in Alamance County. What kind of advertising are you doing? So uh, I don't know what we'll do with this money yet. We'll see if we get the grant, but uh, we do have a uh, very good arrangement through one of our Recreation and Parks Commission members where they give us uh, the billboards on the interstate when they're not being rented for somebody else so they're given to us for free as a public service Good. when they're not rented but we do have to pay for the vinyls the, the materials goes back to what i was talking about earlier yeah. and this does not require a county match there's no there's no county money in this yep yeah. um, so those billboards are always a priority for us because they're such a good bang for our okay, buck. We pay are. 500 bucks and get uh, get a lot for that and uh, we also do a fair amount of online uh, advertising is just very cost-effective. As I said in our last meeting, Alamance County and you guys, particularly with Parks and Rec, 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 Recreation and Parks, I know there's a controversy over that issue, uh, <laughs> do such a good job and we're one of the best kept secrets in the country. Thank you for your, what you do. I'd Thank make a motion that we approve. I got one well, question. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a question that I may need to finance, uh, lady, to uh, help me here. Uh, or maybe the dollar commissioners can help me. Last meeting, we had a situation in which we gave $167,000 to our tourism group, correct? Mm -hmm. My question is, is this 5K coming from them? Yes. Why do we do that? <laughs> I mean, this is... I don't understand why this is done this way. Right. It's not your fault, sir. No, it's fine. It's not your fault at all. I just, when I saw this, I was thinking, okay, we just gave this group $167,000, and they're giving you five of it. Yeah. My question is, why do we give them one sixty-seven? We can, you can just come to us, and we can give you the five grand. I just don't like the accounting. Yeah. I just, I, it's nothing wrong with what you're asking. I think five grand is a. It's like subcontractors. Well, Florida. it's just, it just seems you're, 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 you're pulling money over here and you're sending it over here, but yet you're all in the same, you're all in the same house. So yeah, it's so really sort of a. This is, this is a little thing. strange, so let me explain it because it, it makes me a little uncomfortable to pass this money in this way, too. Okay, excellent. It makes sense at the end of the day, mm -hmm. given the rules that we have. So the occupancy tax is collected uh, by general statute, it has to be distributed the way it is. One third of that goes to the county. Two thirds of occupancy tax collected in Alamance County goes to the Tourism Development Authority. So the Tourism Development Authority is a separate board, mm -hmm. and they determine how that money is spent. The county doesn't get to make those decisions. Um, so that Tourism Development Authority money, uh, they operate the Convention Visitors Bureau. Mm -hmm. They fund that, and they also do give out small grants to help local attractions. So this is not just government. Uh, it's open for Conservator Center as a frequent Alamance Battleground. Sure. Lots of smaller places. They'll give out uh, grants to supplement this sort of thing. Um, it is strange because they are affiliated with the county for the county also to apply for that money. Um, I feel okay about applying for it because it is made by uh -huh. a third party. The decision sure. is made by the Tourism Development Authority, not You not don't me. make the rules, you just play by not it. Not me, mm -hmm. and I feel like I would be putting our department at a disservice mm -hmm. by not applying for this. I points. totally agree with you 100%. Um, and so and that's, that's determined that's by do. the state of North Carolina, not by this board. Right. right, that's general statute, how that money is distributed. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we don't have to apply to get that money back. It just feels like if they're giving it out, I feel mm -hmm. obligated to put our application mm -hmm. in. Sure. That seems kind of like JCPC, you know. That's <laughs> just like the funnel, so right. to speak. Kind of going around your elbow. Big part. Kind of going around your elbow. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> what I looked at. It. I mean, I don't. I, I think what you're what you're doing is it's, it's convoluted. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
Took well, governor has a tendency it, to do that. Yeah. The state legislator, uh, with its infant, excuse me, infinite wisdom, uh, <laughs> has made that determination as to where the tax right. money goes and and yeah. so forth. And now you're trying to use it wisely yeah. to save Alamance County taxpayers' money. Yeah. Yeah. We really don't have an advertising budget to speak of outside of this, so this makes a big difference for us. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. appreciate your response. I assume we need to vote on this. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, motion to approve budget amendment for the Parks and Rec grant. I'll second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Now we'll let you go home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The item we skipped is our item number 10. Um, Mr. Hagan, do you want me to do that or Indeed. you want to do it? Yes, yes, please. Um, we have some almost essential mandatory construction that's going to have to happen with the court system. Um, and the uh, clerk of court, uh, just the across the board, uh, that's been in the planning for some time. Uh, the money has already been, a bu has already been budgeted by um, this board and previous boards, previous boards primarily, but Mr. Uh, Carter approved that previously, uh, for those monies to be spent for an expansion to the Alamance County uh, J.B. Allen Courthouse. Um, in the process of doing that, um, we need to determine as a board, the five of us at this point, how those monies need to be spent, one, Two, what expansion is necessary, you know, how much the clerk needs, how much the sheriff's department to house prisoners and get them back and forth from the jail to the, to the courtrooms, how many courtrooms, things of that sort. Alamance County currently has, and I'm, I'm guessing what, 175,000 is the population roughly. Um, close. And having said that, uh, it's going to increase, uh, the projection is tremendously within the next 10 years. Uh, if we sit on our hands, we're going to be in a situation in a few years that we are, or we're already desperate for courtroom facilities, uh, but it's going to be further impacted almost daily. Um, and as the COVID situation continues to improve, thank goodness, in the health department, uh, we're going to have more and more and more people inside those facilities. Uh, I toured uh, Friday the uh, clerk's office again with the guidance of the uh, of the clerk of court uh, and they have people literally sitting almost on top of each other mm -hmm. the estate office particularly for example uh, they have no spacing is a joke in the estate office for example it's not the only portion in the estate office uh, Sheriff, you have com if s similar situations. They have the same thing in the courthouse and so forth. So my proposal is that we set up a committee, and you already have in your packets what I've proposed, uh, a committee of various individuals to help us, or at least advise us at, the, at this point, um, which buildings need to be expanded or added to or how do we spend these uh, these monies in the best most efficient manner uh, that committee consists of and, and Mr. Haygood help me out if I leave anybody out uh, it, it uh, consists of the, the high sheriff uh, Terry Johnson uh, Mr. Albright someone from your office Mr. Haygood someone from your office yourself particularly uh, myself as chairman um, both the judges, that is Tom Lambeth, Superior Court Judge, and uh, Brad Allen as a District Court Judge, Meredith Edwards as the Clerk of Court, uh, and the President of the uh, Alamance County Bar Association, which is currently Rob Jennings. Uh, that number, those names would change as the occupancy of those various positions change. So we're not naming a named individual to that committee. So for example, uh, if any one of those decided not to run for re-election or, uh, or step down or anything else, then that particular position would take that place automatically. Uh, as chairman, I have asked that I uh, at least set this committee up 
Um, and I would like to, from time to time, be able to bring other commissioners into that number. Uh, but we will leave that as much, at leave as much flexibility in that as possible, because we don't want such a large number of people that it's unwieldy, unmanageable. At the same time, we want to bring in, and I would like to have the flexibility to add others as necessary. So that's my my position, at least my proposal. I think we need to do it uh, soon because one, as Mr. Lashley just pointed out in a previous portion of this meeting, interest rates are going up daily. Uh, we have the monies, by the way, for this first expansion already in our budgets. But the longer we delay this project, the higher the construction costs will continue to climb. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other efficiencies to be gained by making these consolidations as well. If you haven't seen this stuff, guys, you really need to take a look. Yeah. That's true. I'd like a motion to approve. Second it. Any further discussion? I'd just like to say, Mr. Chairman, that as a former assistant district attorney, uh, I know firsthand that the, oh, Sean the DA's Boone is on. Uh, I'm sorry, Sean Boone he's, is on that committee. He's on that way. committee, and uh, and the DA's office has outgrown the allocated space that it has in that yeah. building. You've got DA's sitting on top of each other as well. It's time to uh, I think make this make this happen. And if there's one, you know, one building that a number of Alamance County residents see eventually, if it's for even if it's just for a tax, I mean, a, 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 a speeding ticket, uh, it's the courthouse. So that needs to be a building that allows for uh, the number of people that are going to come into it. And let me remind everyone that this is not uh, a committee that's going to make the decision. This board will make the decisions as to spending money and, and building and so forth. This is a study committee that will help give information to this board. Any other discussion? Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. Okay, um, is Sky Sullivan handling the next? Yes, sir. She, I believe, is joining us by uh, Zoom this evening. This is a Family Justice Center. Every day. Good evening, Commissioners. Can you hear me? There's no name here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I'm here to present the budget amendment for the Family Justice Center Governor's Crime Commission grant. Um, the amendment is to amend a grant project fund with a new budget for grant funding of $525,676.06 um, from the Governor's Crime Commission under the Family Justice Center priority. This is a grant the Family Justice Center has been awarded since 2012, so this is the new grant cycle. Um, these funds are budgeted in a grant project fund because the grant period is from October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2022. So that exceeds the fiscal year time frame used by the general fund. The budget amendment will also adjust the budget from the last grant, which was 2018 through 2020. Um, there was some unspent funding, so that amendment is going to lower the total amount we brought in. Um, this grant, because of COVID-19, there is no county match for uh, 2020 through 2022. And I also want to highlight that there is out-of-state travel for the Family Justice Center Conference in San Diego each year. This year, that conference will be virtual, so there'll be no travel, but next year there will. And that is 100% covered by the grant. Do y'all have any questions for me? I know I said that really fast. Any questions? And at 956, we appreciate the brevity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Motion to approve. What was second? Mm -hmm. Am I okay to vote for this? I didn't vote for the sheriff's grant to the Governor's Crime Commission because I served on that. I just got reappointed. Burger's office called me day before yesterday. And I don't stand to get one dime from it, but I just don't want it to be an appearance of anything. Well, I totally support state that. state law state law does not require you to recuse yourself mm -hmm. but if you feel that strongly about it you could certainly ask the board to to excuse you from voting uh, thing to remember is we all serve on boards yeah. okay. and that's, we that's, that's we're not required to recuse ourselves from decisions okay. that are pertain to those boards yeah. so and I, think, I agree I mr. Carr. I would encourage you to vote yeah. I think you're fine. 
I think you're fine. I'm not fine. Well, if, if, I, if I did, not would say. Well, state law says if you receive <laughs> out of this, are you receiving any personal gain? No. no. Absolutely not. And I think that's the criteria that you should be looking at. Okay. You have a question? Yeah. We just went through the ethics training. And yeah, we did too. If you mm -hmm. are in a position to possibly influence you we were told or I was told to excuse myself right that's that's the reason I asked her are you gaining anything personally and I think the answer to that clearly should be no um, I don't see how she could <laughs> so. I, I just have guilt <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm uh, we can't we can't help your personal guilt <laughs> <laughs> well you're in luck guilt's a no <laughs> Have you worked with the Family Justice Center any time? Yes, I used to work for them Ten. years ago. Are you employed with them now? No. Are you receiving any salary? No. Are you asking the board to make a decision, Pam? Well, let me ask Mr. Albright a question real quick, if I might. Isn't there, isn't there statutes that pertain to our requirement as elected officials to vote on issues yes. that come before us? That's the as statute. As long as we don't have an ethics issue, which is typically any personal gain from the issue itself. That's, that's correct. And the the only way she can be excused from voting is if the board excuses her. Right. If she votes to abstain, is that a vote? Uh, under our rules, that's a vote, yes, mm -hmm. I believe. If she if she does not vote under our procedure, abstain. that is a yes vote. An affirmative that is vote. Correct. I'm going to abstain. You can't abstain. Mm -hmm. You can. But I want you can. You, you can't get it. I want you to say that the can't say yes, vote. Come on, guys. <laughs> you know, I know this comes up. Everybody's faced with stuff like this. I, I just don't feel right about this. I don't ever want me to look like anything like that. I don't want anybody in the sport to look like that. I don't want any kind of shadow casted. I don't want anything like that. I'm all about 100% transparency. And I don't get a dime from this, but I get the honor of serving on the Governor's Crime Commission, and that's a, a huge, huge thing for me. And I just, I don't want to, I don't want it to look like, oh, she's on that, she approves everything that they're writing up for. I, I mean, that, I, I just, it's an honor thing for me. And you're just accepting. I, I move to excuse Miss Thompson from this vote. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. I'll second you, just so we can move on. Thank you. Any further discussion? <laughs> I just think we're setting a bad, a bad precedent. Well, it's just on uh, me, and then it'll be bad on me. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> uh, because we're all required to vote uh, unless we cruise from, from that decision. That's correct. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor of the recusal signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? No. No. So we have two and two. <laughs> so it fails. And she so fails. and, and Miss Thompson vote. votes yes as Bob saying. Well, she wasn't voting on that. She was the she, she can't vote on that. Okay. So <laughs> it's, it's two to two, so it does not pass. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. We have a motion on this. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of this grant signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Any public speakers? No, Mr. Chairman. You do not have any speakers signed up or in the call please. Thank you. No commissioner responses, I assume. Uh, Mr. County Manager. Just very briefly, Commissioners, I just wanted to touch on uh, what's on a lot of folks' uh, minds is the American Rescue Plan State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds, the recently passed legislation uh, inserting it was, uh, a trillion dollars into uh, communities all across the country. Uh, just some high, we're, we're learning. This is uh, fast moving. We're learning a lot about it. We've, I've been uh, listening to calls from the National Association of Counties for the past two weeks. Lots of folks trying to get their minds around what does this money mean. But uh, what, what we've picked up thus far 
Uh, there's $65.1 billion for U.S. counties and another $65.1 billion for U.S. cities. Alamance County share at this time, when I checked earlier today, was $32,875,227. Uh, last NACO call I participated in indicated that number may fluctuate some, but they seem to feel like that's pretty close to the dollar amount uh, that Alamance County will receive. Uh, we're being told to expect 50% of that figure to be a direct allocation to Alamance County within 60 days of the um, law being signed. So we should be getting that within the next two months. And it will come directly from the federal government to Alamance County into Alamance County's bank account. At some point, we're being told that we must certify that we will receive it and uh, that we will use it properly. It's not been made clear to me yet what that means. It could be a vote of the board. It could be the board chair's signature. We don't know, but at some point we'll have to we'll have to signify we'll take it and we'll we'll use it according to the terms uh, that the treasury puts out. And then the next 50%, the second half, uh, the county would receive no earlier than 12 months after the first payment. So about a year, uh, the county would get the remaining roughly 16 million dollars. What I can discern at this moment, there are four very broad ways to spend this money, and these are broad. Uh, number one, respond to the public health emergency with respect to the COVID-19 or its negative economic impacts. <coughs> Number two, respond to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency by providing premium pay to eligible workers of the county that are performing such work or by providing grants to eligible employers that have eligible workers who perform essential work. Number three, for the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year of the county prior to the emergency. And number four, make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Uh, we are fully expecting over the next several weeks to receive much more guidance from the Department of Treasury. This is very, very broad uh, guidelines thus far, uh, but it's very possible this money will come to Alamance County government's account before we get that guidance. That, that very well may happen. Uh, we expect within 60 days we'll get the money, but we may not get the guidance before then. But I will certainly keep the board appraised as we get guidance into our office. Um, I, I do think we probably should very soon, once we get that guidance, start developing priorities for how we want to spend this money. And that may be something the commissioners want to consider forming some talking group, inviting community uh, uh, representatives from either Chamber of Commerce, nonprofits, what other groups to help us think about how to spend $32 million effectively and appropriately. Uh, that's, a, that's a significant amount of money for county government to receive and not uh, really have a, a tangible plan. Once we get these guidelines, I think it'll be very reasonable to consider that. And, and the other thing I picked up in these NACO calls is besides the $32 million that's slated to come for Alamance County, there are multiple other sources in this plan of very large pots of money. I think, for example, I saw the FCC uh, is slated to receive a significant amount of money for broadband also. So county dollars can go toward those kind of uses, but then there are Department of Agriculture, uh, U.S. Commerce Departments that I think once, if, if we have a talking group that establishes some priorities, we can also be looking not only at our funding, but what else is available through this and make some decisions about how to leverage funds appropriately. So uh, very new, very little guidance right now. More guidance is coming. I will certainly keep the board appraised. I do think that once we get that guidance, having some talking group, commissioner representation, of course, uh, but inviting some community reps into to talk about how should the county spend these funds. So. Other than this, I don't have very much information at this at this point, but I, I know it's on your time, your your minds, certainly on ours too. How to how to handle it, and manage it. So uh, I wanted to at least cover it here tonight. So. Do you think we'll have that guidance or guidelines before our um, April budget hearings? Uh, before the uh, before we're listening to uh, departments and outside agencies. That's April 21st and 22nd. It's possible, it's, it's very possible. Based on what we saw with the CARES Act funding that flowed through the state, and this is different, it will come directly to the county from the federal government. When it flowed through the state, they created the NC Pro office, and those were rolling requirements as we went. Uh, I don't, 
our very limited experience with the feds in this area would say we wouldn't see so much of rolling uh, as may, they, they are known sometimes to do big changes later, right? So you have to stay on top of how uh, they regulate these funds. But uh, NC Pro was a constant conversation, I think, with the folks in Raleigh uh, because it changed all the time. So I don't know if we would have it in time for uh, when, the, when the outside agencies are presenting, but I think within a couple of weeks we're going to have it because they want these funds to start being spent and they're uh, going to be providing some guidance. The only things that I've heard thus far that were um, already either off the table or for getting serious looks, one uh, was you cannot put this in any kind of pension fund. That was my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's uh, uh, counties may, across the country have different pension fund requirements. Pension funds are out. Uh, and capital is going to be discussed, right? They were quick because a lot of counties were saying, we got a lot of capital. Can we use this for capital? Uh, the calls that I had been on were like, we're going to have to talk to you about capital. So it may be a little bit longer before we get rules about how we can spend it on capital. But I hope as soon as possible they'll tell us uh, what we can do. Well, there's a lot of money coming into Alabama's County. Apparently the news media this last week has been indicated $100 million or more coming to ABSS. And uh, Dr. Gatewood, I talked to him about it um, Friday, I think it was. He's not sure exactly what they're going to get, but they they could independently get some funding. Um, the county, I, I don't know if the sheriff's office is going to have any access to funding or ABS or, or uh, health department get independent funding. We need to be able to get our hands around, our minds around how much is actually coming into the county so that we don't try and step out and do something that somebody else is also doing. So, I agree, and I think you know, with these funds uh, more than likely not being recurring, we'll have to really think about how you use them. Do you use them in a way that you know you, you um, you're either prepared for the cost that comes when they go away, or you're you're really trying to use them on these one-time uh, costs? You know, a lot of interest in broadband, so that may be a great place to partner with. The cities will be getting some shares. There will be other funding available uh, for specifically for schools and libraries that I saw through FCC. So there may be some ways to partner with school system, libraries, cities, our own funding to try to get you know bigger broadband uh, projects done in Alamance County. That that was a that sounded like one of their major focuses was broadband across the nation, uh, getting to access to high quality broadband. Well, one thing we need, I think, to caution departments against is using funding to hire people they've wanted to hire for a while and once the money goes away then they look at having to come back to the county yeah. to replace that money when those positions weren't required in the first place so got to have versus nice to have sure well I think that's where a, a talking group uh, to talk about how to spend this that would be you know as you develop priorities that could be a priority from the Board of Commissioners to say we really want to at least be aware of the decision that's being made as this tie into long-term funding needs. You may find that valuable. You may find a project that comes out of this that you want to do that, but at least you need to know what is, what's the future here? What does this mean? So you can make an informed decision about it. I, 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 mm, I don't know how to tell people this, but COVID is going to go away. Just like the flu, smallpox, <laughs> syphilis, occasionally it goes on us hurt. There, I mean, hay fever, croup, I mean, whoop and pop. I mean, just, fever hasn't gone away. Well, I'm just telling you, we, it's like this giant fairy that keeps flying through the sky, just throwing money out, and here we go. I've, I've seen this in other areas I've served on, and I just told just read that well, Mr. Biden's going to do the highest tax increase since 1993 because this $34 million is what we're going to all pay for. So it is not like, can you go oh, have fun with that? <laughs> the, this is, we cannot be suckers to this. And I feel like we're just getting so caught up in all this free money. There is no such thing as flipping free money. I'm sorry. I'm, and I'm not going to get on a broom. Yes, I am. <laughs> I just cannot stand to hear this. And Brian, this is not you. I love you to death. But I'm telling you, when I'm hearing about HVACs and chillers and bowlers and all this mess that the school system's been needing to fix for years, and then I hear about roofs and I hear about operating costs, then I hear about 
tax money and all this stuff and gas prices going up. You know, I really don't want to pay $5 this summer for a gallon of gas when I'm getting $34 million to figure out how I'm going to sit around and spend it. It just ticks me off that we're, we're already jumping like we're foaming at the mouth to figure out how we can spend this. I, I've, never, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, it, it, just, it just really ticks me off that I'm afraid we're going to get into this irresponsible mode of thinking this is how it's going to always be. It's going to always be this way because the fairy godmother lives in the White House and we're just going to throw money out like it, it's, just, it's nothing. Last I checked, every time I see the news, they're printing it. They're not making like earning it. They're printing it. Extending unemployment benefits. I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I, doesn't this just help me because you're with me. I know you feel this way. And it, it burns me up because, Brian, you're doing your job and you're the best I've seen. And I'll stand by you any day of the week. But it infuriates me when we are listening to this, like, yeah, it, yeah, it's going to kick us in the butt because I'm telling you, it's coming. Y'all, mark my word. I, I, uh, it's borrowed money. Well, the catch is we have 2022 coming up. Uh, well, maybe we need to figure out how much taxpayers pay the whole bill for the for the county. And if it's under thirty-four million dollars, just say free ride for the year because they're footing the bill for everything. Me, you, everybody in this room, everybody in this county pays these taxes. And I'm telling you, thirty-four million dollars does not go to everybody. It goes to certain things that we're just we're jumping on. The the. The jail's full. Crime does not pay any attention to COVID. You would not believe that I can't come to court today because I was around somebody that might have COVID. Three and four continuances. That's why your court system is backed up. It is a hot mess. And, and we just keep thinking money, just like we can put more money into the little children. They're going to just be healed and be safe. That's BS too. I'm sorry, the female is coming out of me because I am over this this pretend genre that we are so caught up in this is just going to last forever. God help us if we ever go, maybe we're just not going to spend that and we're going to keep that when the whole bottom falls out in a couple of years. So, But Ms. Thompson, aren't we in a position, that, that's why we need the numbers mm -hmm. before we have our April hearings if possible. I don't know that Washington, they're forcing this down our throats. At the same time, we've got to take advantage of it and use no, the money No, you don't. Wisely. You don't have to take advantage of nothing. You we can, can just... give it back and the rest of the states won't. But we won't. Maybe we'll do something honorable and be an example for everybody else to quit sucking the system because that's just the way I feel. <laughs> and, that's, and everybody, I'm sure you know that by now. Yeah, sure. But I'm sorry, Brian. I didn't mean to. Uh, Ms. Don't Thompson. you dare think this is towards you because you are the man. Oh, but yeah, I just I, don't I, like all this free money. It's like get on your little wagon and pop, pop. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, Ms. Thompson, I hear what Follow you say. Up. I hear what you say, and, what, and, and it comes in loud and clear. But let me just alleviate some of your concerns. My job with all this money coming in, and I'm going to prove this to my fellow commissioners that I'm going to show you that we can do this better than anybody else in the state. I that's so. my, that's my, mm -hmm. what I'm going to say to each of the commissioners. If I'm going to have any value on this, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to, I'm going to lead this charge. We're going to know exactly what we're getting, and Brian's going to work with us. All the department heads are going to work with us. You're going to see something that's going to change your attitude that that's you have right now. And I promise you, Ms. Thompson, that I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that every number, every penny that comes by us, I know where and why it's here. I promise you that. And I'll, I'll here. suck in that, that, and I'm okay, just well, right 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 And you know something, we can make this real easy. We can get 34 million bucks, just give it right to the taxpayer. Don't have to do nothing. I'll make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It's just very frustrating. I, I gotta I'm talk sorry. to the county manager first. So <laughs> you have anything else? No, no, that's it's all, all good. Mr. Chair, quick question. You, you, just quick question. Yes. Uh, no, it's all good. Th this is this is a lot of money. I, I think it's um, what uh, about a fourth of our total yearly operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to come with some pretty severe handcuffs on what we can spend it on. Is that right? I, I think we'll see soon the regulations coming down to. to give much more detail about what it can be used for and what it cannot. So even if we wanted to offset some of our operating expenses, we may not be able to do that based on no. federal law. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and, and is there a deadline for when we have to spend this money? December 2024. 2024 is, the, is the deadline to spend, currently. 
and if we if we put together this this talking group that you were talking about, which which I think is a good idea, it, getting a diverse group of opinion on, on how best to to spend this money, if at all, um, is a good idea. But that would necessarily slow down the process. I think so. I, I think uh, you know a good example we saw was bringing in some folks for the small business loan program. We brought in some folks from the chamber. We brought in. Uh, the Self-Help Credit Union and some, uh, I think the Alamance Foundation, people that were more in line with doing that kind of work. So it it will possibly slow it down a little bit if you bring in, you know, outside discussion, but it's certainly valuable. Well, and do you think that if we went with this process where we got a talking group and it slowed it down, would it be difficult to implement allocations of this money for this budget cycle? Uh, Perhaps I think once we see what the restrictions are and what the guidelines are, which we hope to see quickly, if we see those in the next couple of weeks, uh, I'll be sharing those with the commissioners, and it may be that you'll see specific things that are already blessed to use in next year's budget cycle that you agree that that's what you want to do, right? And so you may say, out of this $32 million, we see that it would be wise to use $2 million of it to do something uh, that was part of our budget cycle that you may not want to even throw in the mix with the discussion group. Right. That, that, that's your prerogative as commissioners. And th you know these, these funds are specifically for county governments. It's really, from what I have gathered, going to be left to county governments and their governing bodies to determine how to spend this. So it could be, as I say, once you see that early guidance, if there's a specific way you want to spend it and you know it as a board, you have no doubt about it, and that's what we want to do, and it's going to cost X, and that's going to come off the 32 million then yes that's within your prerogative to say yes we're going to use that we'll track it make it make sure it's spent and reported uh accurately and that leaves x number of dollars for uh you know groups other folks to talk about what what should we do with it? well there have been a variety of needs we've been talking about for the last couple of years uh, one of them is broadband access out in the county i mean north part of the county southern part of the county you drop a phone call you can't get on, kids with a Chromebook can't get online. Uh, a take a hot spot problem. and they can't get a, yeah. they can't, they have to leave the house to go someplace to use the hot spot so they can use their Chromebook in the car to uh, try and do their lessons. And uh, we've been talking about that. That appears to be one of the things we can use some of this money for. So it's going to be really difficult for us to find that money someplace else to do that kind of work with without the possible utilization of funds like this. I agree with you, Pam. I do not like the national debt increasing by $6 trillion. I don't like that at all. And uh, agree. our children, our grandchildren are going to be hamstrung, seriously hamstrung by the amount of debt we've added onto this in this country this past year and in particular this year. Um, I mean we could we could say no and send it back <laughs> but I guarantee you New York, California, Maryland, other states they're gonna suck it up. And what happens if we send it back? <laughs> what are they gonna do? Divide it up among the ones that kept it in the first place? I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions. You can become a slave to debt. Well, we already are, as you, far as this country is concerned, don't right see now. The bars. I'll tell you, it's around your little jail cell. It's just scary. Okay, we have uh, Mr. Hagee. Would you explain to the public what we're getting ready to do with the clay session? I have a motion, Mr. Chairman. If you'd like to. Now we have the motion. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did? Yes, sir. Yeah. You want me to? How much? public information should we disclose, if any? I would just suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, you read the motion and we go into closed session to discuss the two cases. The law requires you to identify the cases we are discussing. All right. Motion. We have a motion, uh, and, well, I will move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the Elements County Attorney and the Board and receive a report regarding uh, the claims made in this case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. I'll make the motion. Does someone else have a second? Second. 
There's a second case as well. I'm sorry? There's a second case entitled Drumright and Allen. All right, and we also have the second case with Drumright versus Allen. Yes. Both would be included. Would you amend your second to approve that? Yes. <laughs> All right. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? We're in closed session. Starbright, do I need a motion to close the uh, closed session or just announce it? I would just uh, suggest that uh, you read that statement and then go back into open session. We'd like to announce that the board received a report from the county attorney concerning the cases mentioned in the motion. We are now out of our closed session and back in the full session. Anything else? Do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Do we have I, a second? I second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We are now out of session. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.